Hello and welcome to day three of the Sonic and Iconic Virtual Art Gallery. I'm Joe Cleon and this is... Anastasia Pancios. And between the two of us we have 50 years of concert photography. And uh, we are providing a different set of photos each night this week, uh, ending off on Sunday. And uh, over 1,100 photos, 50 years of concert photography, and tonight we're going to focus on just one person. A dear friend of ours, Cleveland's favorite son, Michael Stanley. We have uh, worked with Michael... Since 1974, Anastasia 74 has, and the, uh, the earliest I've worked with them for the last 20 years. When I first started taking photos, I was working on the air at WNCX, and I met Michael because he does a show there. Started coming out to shoot his shows, and 20 years later, here we are, 50 yeah. years of concert photography. So we're going to give you over 100 photos spanning Michael's entire career, some of the stories behind the photos, and then at the end, we will get into an hour and a half oral history for Michael Stanley. It was recorded back in 2013 at my, uh, my uh, Decade of Decibels Art Gallery at the uh, Space Rock next to the Beachland Ballroom. Michael came out, David Spiro hosted. We uh, wanted to record his entire oral history. We only got halfway done, all the way through the MSB years. It's a great hour and a half, amazing stories, funny stories. If you're a Michael Stanley fan, you are really going to love it. That's going to happen right after we go through these photos. And then we always wanted to finish things off. And the years went by, and we never really had a chance. Last year, we did an art gallery called Raining Rock at 78th Street Studios. And uh, we asked Michael if he wanted to come out and finish things up, and he said, absolutely. So David Spiro and Michael came out to uh, 78th Street Studios, and we finished up part two of his oral history. And that's going to be broadcast this Sunday after photos we call Cleveland Connected. So three and a half hours just about covering Michael's entire career. First part tonight, second part Sunday. And uh, the, the, the oral histories will end up in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's library and archives. So very, very cool stuff. It's very cool. The stories are, are really, really fantastic. Michael is an amazing yeah. storyteller. So he we're going to get into that. Right now we're going to fire up our photo slideshow. So we will get our ugly mugs off the screen and we'll give somebody that's uh, much better looking than us, Michael Stanley. <laughs> All right, let's begin with our Michael Stanley photos, and we'll start off with this photo here, a photo I took in 2006 that I didn't even remember that I took. Uh, Barry Gable from Live Nation had got a hold of me and wanted a non-concert photo of Michael for uh, a Q&A he was doing at the Rock Hall. Um, a couple years ago, one of his albums came out three or four years ago, and I didn't think I really had any non-performance shots that were really worth anything. And I remembered this photo shoot that we did with uh, Augie Wa uh, Walken Kane and uh, and E Rock. They did some trio blues shows together, about half a dozen, and they wanted some promo photos. So we met Michael at WNCX about 20 minutes before we started on the air. Walked around the corner to one of the alleys downtown. And while E-Rock and Augie were getting themselves together, Michael was just sitting there noodling on his guitar against the wall. I was setting up my camera. I took two shots, didn't even remember that I took them, and I gave that shot to Barry Gable, and since it's become one of my most popular concert photos. Um, one of my favorite photos of Michael, and it was taken just to set the settings on my camera. So that's how we kick off. Once again, all of our photos are for sale. Go to the links in the description at joecleon.com and at the Sonic and Iconic Facebook page. You can pick up photos, any photo that you see, lots of different sizes available, and they come from Cleveland's number one printer, NEO Pro Imaging, and their website is neoproimaging.com. Continue on here with another one of my favorite shots of Michael. I think that's from Packard Music Hall. This one is from House of Blues back in the late 2000s, um, one of the holiday shows that he did every year between Christmas and New Year's. And this photo has been used a lot by different publications. And the uh, compilation of Michael Stanley's solo material, the three CD set called The Solo Years, uses that photo as the front and back cover of the CD booklet. No writing on the CD booklet, just that photo in half with the front and uh, the back cover. One of my favorite band shots um, from Michael. Another one from one of those holiday shows at House of Blues. That one I think is from Clay's Park. That's from Squeeze Play. Do you remember Squeeze Play, Anastasia? No, I don't. Squeeze Play was a little bar at the corner of Brook Park and Pearl in that shopping plaza. And they had local Out bands. Of my stomping ground. They had a lot of local bands there, and Michael would play there with Midlife Chrysler's Midlife his Chrysler's, his side yeah. project, and yeah. that was a Midlife Chrysler's photo. Okay. And I've always always loved that photo. Continue on through some more photos. Uh, Bob Palander, right there. That's one of your shots. Yeah, Bob Palander, who was one of the core members of the Michael Stanley Band, has continued to play with 
Michael Solo, Michael and the Resonators, he and uh, Tom Dobeck yep, he lives out have in... been with Michael since the mid-70s and just are really important to his sound. He lives out in Vegas and uh, travels into town to, uh, to play with Michael. Yeah. Danny Powers, that's a photo of mine. That's another photo of mine. Uh, not really sure where or when that one is from. 2002, I think. That's an early one when I first started shooting. Mark Lee Shannon, 2002, the date says on that one, along with that one. That must have been probably one of those Tower City shows. 2006, who knows where those came from. I've shot Michael so many times, and I, I see these photos. I, I unless know. unless there's a really memorable part of the the back the backdrop I, or something. I'm the same way. I mean, I shot every one of those shows that he performed at Blossom Music Center in wow. the eighties. I when they did their run at the Palace Theater, I think I shot all of those. When they did their final run at the Front Row, I probably shot six six of those. Wow. Good shot of Michael and E-Rock right there. That's from yeah. Tower City back in 2002. Yeah. Once in a while for one of the last songs, E-Rock comes down from his riser and jams out with the band. How about that one? Tell me about that. That was also Tower City Amphitheater. That uh, on the the right, of course, is Jennifer Lee, who has been uh, a backup singer, co-singer in the Resonators since they started. And his daughter, Sarah, who came on stage to perform with him. They've done that a few different times over the years. Very, yeah. very cool Oh, yeah, photo. I've seen them on stage. Jennifer Lee and Mark Lee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not related. <laughs> They're middle yeah. names. No. Um, very cool. Jennifer and Michael. Yeah. The Tower City, too. There's Jennifer just no, by herself at yeah. Tower City Amphitheater. That's a nice shot. I, I, I love shots sometimes where an artist isn't actually singing, where they just have well, a really and great, she's really very great photogenic. look. she's photogenic. And I yeah. first photographed her when she was 17 years old in a band called Brat that was just a local cover band, very short-lived. And they had an interesting story, too, because after she, you know, she decided she wasn't into it anymore and she quit, um, they had this creepy manager who sued her and her parents because she was underage for like a million and a half dollars, claiming that he had invested all that money in what was basically just a local bar band. And I, as I remember, it got thrown out of court. You could <laughs> wow. ask Jennifer, but it was it was really stupid. <laughs> There's been a lot of creepy management types oh, over the years in yeah, Cleveland. You yeah, know? you could write a whole book about them. You've just Phil Lara Ma recently. Remember that guy? Manager's age. <laughs> oh, Phil Lara. Yeah, he almost destroyed the entire music scene. Yeah. <laughs> Black and white shot of Michael Stanley from 2006. That might have been a Cuyahoga Falls gig, if I remember okay. correctly. Um, that is the most published, used photo I've ever taken. I took that in 2004. Tower City Amphitheater. I hadn't shot Michael maybe a year and a half or two years. Hadn't shot a lot of shows. And he just sprung it on me. Hey, we're doing a band photo before the show. And we shot maybe for two minutes in two different locations. It was very quick, very rushed. I was very nervous. Never completely real happy with that photo. I would have spaced people out a little bit. But, uh, man, he's used that for every show since 2004. And it's been used in so many magazines and so many newspapers. And it's my, my most widely used photo. And it was just a spur-of-the-moment thing, just probably less than 10 minutes before they went on stage. I think I have some other versions from that photo shoot in here. And I've never published or, or showed any of those photos before. So that'll be the first time when that comes up. That, I believe, was from Nautica? Or Tower, yeah, Nautica, um, 2011, maybe? And then we go back, very old, to Michael and, uh, and Gary, Gary Markowski? Markowski, yeah. yeah, that was probably from the early 80s. And I think this one, I don't know why I think this, but I think it may have been from Richfield Coliseum. Uh, because in the early 80s, Michael actually held the attendance mm -hmm. record at every single venue in the area. Yeah. He packed more people into Richfield Coliseum, into Blossom, you name it. Front um, row. Front row, Clip Playhouse Square, every place. And I think uh, he did New Year's Eve, a couple of New Year's Eve shows there. That may have been one of those. I'm not sure. That's a great photo. Really great black and white photo of them. Yeah. And there's Michael at WMMS uh, being interviewed on the air. And, uh, you know, giving me a side look there. Very nice photo there. Yeah. I always like this color one. It almost yeah. looks like a painting more than it does a I photo. I love the great colors. Um, that was from Clay's Park, I believe, a uh -huh. show that he did out in Clay's Park. Yeah. There's one of my favorite ones of yeah. yours. That's I a great shot. I think that may also be from Richfield Coliseum. It's a very Michael shot. 
If I remember correctly, this one's from Packard, uh, Packard Music Hall or whatever they call it. Packard, I love the way the lights in, fan out and just sort of in converge Warren. in on him. I think that's a little exit sign above his head there. <laughs> oh, I always get rid of exit signs. <laughs> I should have got rid of that. That's There's... earlier. That's uh, And I don't know where the venue was, but that was in the 70s. I recognize the bad perm. Wow, wow. Yeah. Here's one where, from 2015, somebody hired Michael to play a private party at a country club, rented out the country club, hired Michael and the entire band to come play, and uh, this was the room in the country club where they did the show, and uh, they spent an ungodly amount of money, I'm sure, to make all that happen, but it was uh, just a private, a private gig, mm -hmm. and uh, they hired me to come out and shoot it. So it was fun shooting a private gig like that. That's one of the New Year's Eve ones um, from House of Blues when they used to do the balloon drops right at, uh, right at New Year's Eve. That's another one from Nautica with the skyline in the background. That looks like a really old one. That was. That was could have been the uh, even the Agora, but I shot him so many weird offbeat places. I don't even remember the names of anymore. Some of them were like in Pittsburgh and Canton. That was probably <clears throat> 75, 76. Wow. Would that have been? God, what album? I can, you, don't, you don't know what album tours those are. Well, you know, they weren't necessarily album tours either because they filled in their schedule with these one-off gigs at, gotcha. you know, some little joint out in Steubenville or someplace <laughs> that weren't really part of any tours, but they were just ways that the band made money and played. Um, A couple of nice, really nice black and white shots. Here's one of those um, unreleased shots from that photo shoot, you know, from the Tower City photo. And this is back backstage. We took a couple of these shots, mm -hmm. and again, the spacing was off. It was really rushed, um, and I just never would use but that that's photo. That's what makes just... a good photo. The ones that are too even look like lounge bands. Yeah, I don't really think they, I think that having the off-kilter uh, off um, spacing is good. I, in I included that for the uniqueness of it because I've never showed it before from that yeah. photo shoot. Oh, but I think I, it's a I'm, great shot. Yeah, thank you. I, I might disagree, but no, I appreciate it. Well, you should. Here's, here is one from the uh, a very close variation of the other shot. Mm -hmm. um, with Michael actually smiling, mm -hmm. um, but he had chose to use the other one. But I remember I did give him some of these other shots. Mm -hmm. Nice shot of E-Rock playing with Michael. That's a recent one from uh, the Christmas show 2018 in December. I believe that that would be uh, the Roxino or MGM or whatever you call it. Another sepia shot from that same venue. I like the sepia effect on that one. Mm -hmm. Danny Powers, 2018, probably that same show. I think that's also the same show. Again, I always try to maneuver around and get really good lighting composition shots that's like that. Nice, I yeah. love when the light can be right on the edge of the subject's face and then the, the rays of the light fan out over their body. I think that's a cool effect. Um, that's one of your shots, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think that might be Blossom. I'm not sure. There were so many shows at Blossom. Uh, you know, they all run together. <laughs> that's earlier. Again, that's a show it, probably from the mid to late 70s, um, and I don't remember where. That's definitely a Blossom show. That's a nice black and white shot. Cool cool jacket he's wearing, a shirt or whatever. Yeah, Very I nice. like the lighting on that, though. Yeah. I love this baseball shot. Um, that was uh, one of these, you know, back in the day, radio stations in particular hosted these all-star games. I think... They may have been playing a team from WMMS because MMS did a lot of these. So they would have like the band versus MMS. And they were big promotional events. I mean, MMS would blow them up and, you know, hundreds of fans would come down to watch because it was a great opportunity to see, you know, their favorite musicians and their favorite DJs in a casual setting. Who plays baseball with sunglasses on? Michael. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen someone at bat with sunglasses. On. Well, I don't think winning was the goal here. I know, that's just funny. Uh, and nice there's another one from Blossom. Yeah, that's a nice black and white shot. Yeah. Very cool. And that was, I think, cheap at Richfield Coliseum. I think Cheap Trick was opening to Michael, if I remember. He, this was probably early in Cheap Trick's career. During one of the oral histories that we're broadcasting, part one's coming up very soon, stick around, and part two on Sunday. During one of the oral histories, and I can't remember which one, he talks about... And David Spiro talks with him about all the bands that have opened up for him, like Cheap Trick and, you know, 
um, Billy Joel and just Rex all, all, Smith. all the bands that have, that have opened for him over yeah. the years. And yeah. uh, just some really good stories about these iconic performers. Um, John Cougar and people yeah. that, you know, that opened up for there Michael back in the day. Yes. So that's so that's a nice conversation to watch out for when you're yeah. checking out these oral histories. And um, that was actually taken in Chicago, I believe, at Navy Pier. Um, they played like a Summerfest kind of thing there, so that they had the huge crowd. That there. is a great. That is a great shot with the crowd. It just yeah, the, the low the Chicago, aperture shot with the out of focus crowd. Sky, skyline too. Yeah. Very very cool. Very very yeah. cool effect with the crowd and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And that's another one. Could have been a blossom. I'm not sure. I mean, I just again shots. And that was uh, one of these small rock festivals they used to have around places like like Canton and Mansfield and places like that. And I don't remember where it was. But, you know, they would find a field or a local park, and they might have, you know, six, seven bands play. I saw the New York Dolls play at one of these types of things. The World Series of Mansfield. Yeah, it was something <laughs> like that. I, That's I a great photo. Yeah. And that uh, was a really interesting photo because that was taken at Cleveland State. Uh, I forget what it was at the gym, I think, um, in the summer of 74. And at the time... Michael uh, was playing as a trio with Dan Pacquio, who you see on the left there, and Jonah Coslin. And they performed sitting on stools playing acoustic guitars. And I'm kind of, I don't like acoustic music all that much. It, I, it, unplugged is not my thing. Plug it in and turn it up. And after <laughs> the show, I told Michael that I was not coming to see the band unless they got rid of the stools and got a drummer. And about a week after that show, Michael and Danny showed up at my, my door one night, and they said, uh, we're going to go out and listen to some drummers tonight. And they asked me specifically, Circus was playing. That was to The band Tommy was about to leave. He told the band, I'm tired of, of rock and roll. I'm going back to school. Um, I said, uh, yeah, he's a really good drummer, but he's, he's you know leaving the music scene either, uh, entirely. He's just not interested. But they went down to hear him anyway, and they talked to him afterwards, and it turned out, yeah, he, he would be interested. It turned out he was tired of circus, not tired of rock and roll. Um, so that was the beginning of uh, them getting a drummer and being a real rock band. And the gentleman on the right <coughs> is Peter York, who um, he opened that show, also sitting on stools with acoustic guitars, with another Cleveland legend, or Northeast Ohio legend, uh, Phil Kagey. Wow. Um, this was after Phil had left Glass Harp. He left Glass Harp because he wanted to focus on Jesus, and he joined <laughs> a group out of Austin Town called the New Birth Jesus People, and he decided they weren't pure enough for him, so he took Peter York, who was very young at the time, I think he was in his teens, and he and Peter started performing as a duo playing Jesus music. He decided that wasn't Jesus enough for him. Jeez, so, how much Jesus do you need? <laughs> Man. Well, he got real Jesus at that point in 74. And he was about this, I think this may have been the last uh, gig he performed as a duo with Peter before moving up to Freeport, New York to join Scott Ross's Jesus People Commune, <laughs> um, where he was just going to immerse himself in Jesus 24-7. So it was kind of an interesting gig that it was kind of an ending point for two real um, Northeast Ohio icons. And during the oral histories, Michael talks about doing the three-man acoustic thing on stools and talks about how apprehensive he was to actually get a drummer because the three-man acoustic thing was kind of laid back. It didn't require much responsibility very, or anything. Very laid back. And he says, once I got a drummer, I had to get serious, and it was a real band, and I just, you know, it was going to be a real got, commitment. That's when they got and, good. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good conversation. He talks about this time period, not knowing that you were going to present this photo. Yeah. So he told the story, and you had the photo, and they just kind of came together as a coincidence. That's, and that's right. That's very, very cool. Nice shot of uh, Michael and uh, Michael his daughter. And, Michael and Sarah, yeah. And there's Michael backstage. Um, I'm not really sure when. It might have been at the Palace Theater. I'm not sure. But it was just a casual shot backstage. That's another onstage shot. Um, I think it may have been at Richfield. And that was Blossom with Gary. And that was just taken in the Belkin offices. I went there 
to shoot. They were doing some promotional letter writing promotion, and I just happened to grab a candid shot that came out looking like a, a portrait. And I actually processed this um, to look like there was a photographer named Norman Seif, who was a South African photographer who did album covers by every iconic artist. And he had this weird kind of effect that was sort of uh, soft edge. It wasn't really soft focus. And I was trying to figure out how he did it. And then I read that he did it by putting a stocking over the enlarger. Wow. And you wow. had to experiment to get it just right so it wasn't really out of focus. But I did this, and I thought this one came out nice. Yeah, that's a very nice shot. Yeah. And there is Michael uh, backstage. I don't remember where, with uh, the <clears throat> legendary Jane Scott, the writer from The Plain Dealer, um, who was probably asking him where he went to high school, even though she probably asked him that, you know, 500 times. <laughs> um, so she always looked for the personal interest angle. That was her thing, you know, trying to humanize performers. So, she, you know, I'm sure she didn't ask him for the 100th time what high school uh, he went to, but she was maybe asking him, like, oh, what do they have in the dressing room for you to eat tonight? Or, you know, just little things that she liked to throw into her stories. And Michael was always a big fan of hers. Michael just loved her. How could you not be a fan of hers? Yeah, she was so sweet. He, uh, he tells a story about the final run of 14 shows at the front row. Yeah, we're and getting to that. him and Jane were the only people, yeah. the last people out the door. Um, yeah. Another great part of that. The oral histories, I can't stress enough if you're a fan that you have to listen to those. Yeah. They're just amazing. And there's, there's Michael shot. and Jennifer. Wow, um, that's and I that's think, a great I shot. I think that may have been from Tower City, too. That's a really great shot. Thank you. And that was actually taken at the old Lakefront Stadium. I think Joe Walsh was performing that night, but I don't remember. And this David Spiro uh, at the at the right uh, left, who's hosting the uh, oral histories, mm -hmm. and Michael chatting with uh, Joe, who's dressed for the occasion. Mark Lee Shannon, That's looks like from 2019... Wow. Their uh, last show at uh, MGM. Iraq from the same show. Paul Christensen from the same show. Just always great when you get someone perfectly centered under lights like that. That's great. Um, that shot kind of takes itself. Yeah. You know, you yeah. can be on the side and see that, and you just move straight over. And yeah, yeah, that was that was the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Um, Danny Powers. That's also from that same show. And Tommy. Tommy. A lot of show. A lot of shots from that 2019 show. That's one of my favorites of Michael and Jennifer. That's from uh, the 2019 show as well. Uh -huh. um, don't experiment much with doing the black and white color combination stuff, but I tried it with that one and just thought it worked, so I kept it the same. Kind of good for family photos and stuff. Never really do it much for concerts, but I thought that was a, a cool combo. Black and white shot from there. And uh, that was one... Is that? I think that was one that was used on one of Michael's CDs from back in the day. Um, there's a nice trio shot. That's 2019. And then we get over to one of yours here. That was taken in the late 70s, I want to say, and I don't remember where, but, you know, we used to hang around a lot. And there's always downtime before shows, you know, and I would just hang out and take casual shows backstage shots candid shots are awesome it's yeah very yeah, very cool vibe that. on that shot that, that was too. taken at the uh backstage at the palace theater one year for thanksgiving they did a run of shows at the palace and this was i think the 87 88 so it was you know when they they had been doing all those blossom shows twenty thousand seaters and the palace theater is about three thousand seats so they did a whole bunch of shows there and they dressed up for them they wore these very elegant they wore you know elegant outfits they all dressed in tuxedos i remember that i had a a silver tunic and leggings that i wore to the shows nice. because I, I wanted to be dressed appropriately so that was a lot of fun that's another i think blossom show that looks about the Blossom era, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, and they, these shows were great to shoot because they had so much stage space and such great lights. And you had such great stage access. Yeah, and I had access, full access. That was taken in the late, late 80s, I think at the studio, this Beach, Beachwood recording. It used to be Beachwood recording. It's now Chris Keffer's studio. Um, and I, they were recording a charity record. This was the We Are the World kind of era, and they did, oh, is it called The Eyes of the Children? That somehow sticks in my mind. But they were recording a charity record. And very that's cool why he was shot. there. Yeah, very cool. 
um, that's also probably blossom. That is probably that was the Agora, and that was the taping of Stage Pass. Nice. And they, as I remember, they did three nights when they taped Stage Pass. And the Agora had a capacity of about a thousand people, and they packed almost three thousand in. Wow. For each of those nights, <laughs> I mean, it, it was really because it was a, you know, he was big. He's starting to get really big here. It was explosive thing. So you can see the cameraman over at the right there, because uh, they were they doing some video too. Um, but they were taping those shows for this what became the Stage Pass album. Did they ever release any of those videos? What? Did they ever release any of those videos? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know what happened to That'd them. That'd be a good question for for Michael or Dave Wade or somebody that knows yeah, yeah. every well, aspect of the history. David would probably know because yeah. he was involved at the time. And that's also from that show. And, wow. you know, obviously, you know, with the Agora, if you wanted to shoot in the front of the stage, it was a low stage with no pit. You had to get there early. Yeah. I mean, we're famous for we'd get in there just as the doors were opening. So this show, that wasn't possible. So I was shooting at the side of the stage for this show. That was the same with Peabody's if you wanted to get there. If yeah, you wanted to shoot yeah, in yeah. front, you had to get there way, way early. Yeah, and that was taken when that Stuart Copeland of the police that was taken when he... Spent a lot of time in Cleveland. He wrote an opera called Holy Blood Crescent Moon that was performed by the Cleveland Opera in the late 80s. And um, Michael uh, was interviewing him for the radio. He must have been on M NCX at the time, I'm guessing. What year would that be? Would that be PM Magazine? Maybe. I don't remember whether it was PM Magazine or whatever he was on at the time. Uh, but Stewart did a ton of press for it. So they were just sitting there in the, pa in the State Theater just shooting the breeze. That's a great candid shot. Yeah. Really, really nice candid yeah. shot. And that, I think, was also Blossom. I was, that was more recent. That was Tower City Amphitheater. Nice red, uh, red yeah. lights there. Yeah. Hard to get a good looking red light picture. I know. That was Tower City as well. <clears throat> And also Tower City yeah, that's Amphitheater. Yeah, nice, that's a nice shot with the light rays to the right. Yeah, and that was uh, that was also one of those candids that was taken in the Belkin office. Um, I, there were a couple of times that we went there and, you know, we were doing some kind of promotion. And I would just shoot pictures like that. Yeah, that's a very cool, another cool candid shot. Yeah, that was from Tower City Amphitheater, yeah. And that was, and I can't remember specifically why Clarence Clemens was there. He played on a couple of his albums. But he showed up and jammed with uh, Michael, and I think that was Richfield Coliseum, too. Wow, very cool shot there. Nice, iconic yeah, moment. And there he is again with Sarah, his daughter, and that's with, uh, I really love the shot just because of the way the diagonals converge. Yeah. With Gary Markaski in the background, and I think think that is Richfield Coliseum. That is a great, really great composure there for sure. Yeah, and that was probably either Richfield or uh, Blossom. That was Blossom for sure. And that was earlier. Again, I don't remember the venue, but that was probably late 70s. It was the Bad Perm era again. Maybe Cabin Fever era, possibly? Yeah, it could have been. Well, Jonah was gone by that time, okay, so probably yeah. not. It was probably after that. That was 2013. That might have been at Packard Music Hall um, out in Warren. Shot a yeah. couple shows out there with That's Michael. Nice. Um, 2010, I couldn't tell you where that one was. Maybe House of Blues. Uh, I don't know. We've uh, both shot way too many Michael Stanley shows. I know shows another 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 2010. Yeah. 2002. That's that's, nice. that's got to be Tower City or that is that one of yours? No, that's no, your... that's yeah, that's yeah, TCA. Yep, that's Tower City, yeah. 2002. That was the first year I started shooting. So those are some of my earliest Michael uh -huh. shots. Was that I started like in January, and that would have been summer Tower City. So that was right. just a, that was just a few months into it. Um, that's 2003. Um, that's also Tower City. That's Tower City, 2004. Kind of doing that every yeah. year. Um, I think that's another 2004, along with that one. Nice shot of Danny Yeah, and I Mark. shot a lot of shows at Tower City, yeah. too. 2004 for those as well. I don't know why I got so many from that one show. 2002 for this one. Don't know where that was from. And then again, that's another 2004. That yeah, that's probably a uh, that's probably a Midlife Chrysler show, uh -huh. just because of the club banner back there. That might have been at the Savannah or something like that. <laughs> God. <laughs> I don't remember. That is uh, 2009. 
And I think that's House of Blues. I'm pretty sure that that's House of Blues. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's from the same show. So yeah, definitely House of Blues. Good shot of E-Rock from that House of Blues show. Nice shot that's with him nice. in the crowd behind him. That's yeah. also from uh, 2006 House of Blues. Uh-huh. 2010. How about that one? It's the front row. That's okay. the last last bow, the last show. Wow. Of Michael Stanley band. That was their last appearance. Wow. I didn't. I never knew you caught the last bow of the last show, of the the fourteen show front yeah. row series. Wow. I, that's I was that's at, a legendary shot right there. I was right at there. like probably six, seven, eight of those shows, and uh, yeah. That is a legendary shot right there. Wow. Yeah, that very was the, very the cool. The very end of the band. Very cool. And that I actually took in the early 80s. It was a fast food restaurant up at Severance. It's no longer there. And I was actually, uh, they were running a short item. This was probably when He Can't Love You was out because Rolling Stone was running a short item and asked me to take a picture of the band. One of the first handful of videos ever played on MTV. Yeah. He Can't Love You. Very first day it was number 13 or something. Yeah. And that was the final bout, one of the Blossom shows. Wow, very cool. Yeah. That's the shot before that we opened up with. That was the reason we were actually there to take the shots with E-Rock and, and Walking Cane. That was the shot we went to took, but the original shot was the one of just Michael getting ready. He uh, put his guitar down for that shot, but yeah, I've always always liked those shots we did in that alley. That was yeah, that was fun. That was nice shot of Michael and E-Rock. That's probably from Tower City early on, oh two, oh three, somewhere around there. That's a shot from oh nine. That would have been from Nautica, I believe. No idea where that one's from. That, again, I think is from one of the House of Blues holiday shows, 2009, I think. Mm -hmm. Another color black and white one I experimented with. That's from 2009. And that is the last one. Oh, again, all these fast. photos are for sale. So if you'd like to purchase some photos, links are in the description of this video. You can also find links at the uh, Sonic and Iconic page. You can find links at joecleon.com. And uh, please order some photos. Support Anastasia and myself, and you'll also be supporting NEO Pro Imaging, which is the printer of all the photos that we're selling for this virtual art gallery. So make sure that you go to neoproimaging.com. And now the moment that everybody's been waiting for, just waiting for us to shut up and get to the meat and potatoes of this whole thing, the oral history part one from Michael Stanley. This was recorded in 2013 at my Decade of Decibels Art Gallery. And uh, it's really, really a great hour and a half of just Michael talking about his career and different stories from throughout his career. And uh, part two will be Sunday night. We will end off our Sonic and Iconic Gallery Sunday night with part two of the oral history. So let's get into it. Part one, Michael Stanley's oral history, the very first time it's ever been broadcast, an exclusive right here on Sonic and Iconic. Let's get into it. station <clears throat> they came out and started shooting us it was uh, uh, you know it was kind of a, a two-way street we could use some photographs to give somebody to photograph it all worked out that way and then it, I kept saying oh, can't you make us look younger <laughs> 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 all, all these tricks oh, shots from 2002 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi dude well, hey Michael how are you I'm good how are you good to see you good I remember you. Yep. Yeah. I know a lot of things about him that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, it's it's kind of a, an amazing thing. I'm, you, you've been playing music since you were a teenager. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're probably in some way, shape, or form approaching 50 years of making music of some sort. And to, like, narrow that down into, you know, an hour to two hours, whatever it takes to go through, um, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, it will be. I think next year will be 50 years. <laughs> so, what, so the first time you were singing Elvis in front of the mirror. Yeah. You were what, like 15 years old, maybe? Or? Oh no, back then that was—I would have been like—I would have been like, I been like uh, 
six, seven, eight. Oh, okay. See, that, that's, you know, people, they, they all have times they ask, you get asked the question, what are your influences and stuff? And, you know, you can pick out different people once you become, you know, once you try to be a songwriter or that. But in the beginning, it was it was everybody because when I, as I was growing up, it was the exact time that the rock and roll got going. It was Elvis and Buddy Holly and the Everly Brothers and Little Richard and, and uh, everybody. And it was all new and it was all just amazing because, you know, before that it had been how much was that doggy in the window by Rosemary Clooney. There's a big jump from that to, you know, Little Richard. Uh, so that was the, those were the people that, that got me wanting to do it. And um, I certainly never thought it was something I would do. It wasn't something anybody did back then. Nobody knew anybody in a band. There weren't bands, you know. And if there were, they were like one step above cat burglars or something. You know? So it, was, it wasn't something you looked at like, oh, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be in a band and I'm going to do this. So when did you finally realize that you could do it? I think, like most people, you know, the, that, that first Ed Sullivan show with the Beatles, that was a Sullivan show that launched <coughs> five million bands. Right. You know, 900,000 of them horrible bands, you know, but bands nonetheless was the first time everybody, and I think, you know, you got to be honest about it, other than the fact that it looked like it, was, it would be fun, and it was certainly better than working at McDonald's or something like that. It was, it was like you looked in the audience and, you know, oh, there's a lot of screaming girls out there. <laughs> <laughs> and these guys are getting paid for this, you know. That's, there's a certain, uh, certain allure there. And like I said, anybody, tell, anybody tells you they got in a band for any other reason is lying. <laughs> it may have changed as they moved on and there were other things came into it, but that was the, Probably not. the main thrust of, of the whole thing. You know. And when did you put on your first guitar? Um, I'd been one of those kids that, that uh, my, I was like my parents sort of indulged me in, in as much as they could in, you know, like, oh, I want a chemistry set or I want a microscope or I want, you know, this. And it would last about a week, you know, and then it would go into the closet. And so I, one of the ones finally was, oh, I want a guitar. And that's where they drew the line. They said, no. They said, we're tired of buying things and you're only doing it for a week. And they said, if you want a, if you want a guitar, you earn half the money for the guitar, we'll match the other half, figuring I wouldn't do it. And, right. But I did, and, and they held up their end of the bargain. We bought a real cheap guitar, you know, and, and started taking uh, some lessons from a guy in Rocky River. And the, after about three or four lessons, uh, he wouldn't, uh, I asked him to teach me some Chuck Berry songs, which, you know, I might as well have just, you know, sworn at him or something, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. And he, he said, no, and so I, I, that was the last guitar lesson I ever took, as you can tell. Yeah, I think you've done okay. I mean, no, you, I you know, heard, this, is, this is a good history so far, up to here, you know. So you, you, you got into some high school bands and playing yeah, around. I played band in high school, and then I went to college, and I uh, went to a small college, and there was one band at, in, at the college. And you sort of had to wait for somebody to graduate or get thrown out of school to be able to get into the band. And luckily the singer graduated, so I got into that band. And then played with some other guys back uh, at home during the summer, and, and we, were, we were real lucky. We got signed to a label, uh, which was like, you know, that was the ultimate dream of everything. And, and to this day, <coughs> excuse me, we were signed by Bill Simzik, who went on to very seriously illustrious career and who I still work with luckily still one of my best friends but the bottom line of the whole thing and the truth is if he hadn't been if he hadn't taken acid that night he never would have signed us he never <laughs> would have signed us it was just we were we weren't that good a band and it was the right chemical at the right time with the right band and that was silk I was well at the time we were called the tree stumps right and <clears throat> For some reason, the record company did not like that name. I can't understand why. <laughs> but when Bill was in town, when he was in town that week, he signed us and he signed the James Gang. And uh, he went on to do their albums and, and most of Walsh's albums. And then got on board with the Eagles and did all their biggest albums. And Bob Seger and The Who and everybody. Uh, Edgar so, Winter. Yeah, and, but it was yeah. just one of those right yeah. places at the right time, which is so much of the music business anyway. It's, there's a lot of great players and singers. You probably all know somebody who's better than a lot of people you pay to see. But for whatever reason, because they didn't have the, you know, the will to stick it out or because they just didn't want it enough or 
because they didn't care about one way or the other. You know, they're doing something else. And the ones that, you know, it, I always said that, you know, talent's not going to get you there. It's not going to get you your first break, you know. Luck's going to get you your first break. If you have any talent, then you have the chance to maybe turn it into a career. But, so. so with the first Silk album, did that, did that uh, like, open doors, and now you're opening for major bands, and you're on tour, and the rock and roll dream is happening, or...? Well, uh, the dream for us was to make a record. That, okay. was, that, was the, that was the whole dream. It was like, make a record, hold it in your hand, maybe hear it on the radio. Yeah. All those things happened. And really, if it had ended there, you know, I could have been pretty happy to a certain extent because that was all I had set out to do. No, like I said, no one looked at this as, oh, you're going to do this as a career. You're going to do this, you know, as something, you know. Um, well, the, the Beatles thought it was going to last three years. Right. Yeah. And, and most, I mean, most bands, you know, it's like NFL football players. They, they're, it's three years. That's about it, the max. And you, know, you all know, you all know, fifty people who have been in bands. You know, and now they're insurance salesmen, or they're doing this, or they're doing that, and and then maybe they play on the weekends, or play for fun, and that's what it's all about anyway. But to actually going and make a make a living at it, um, I read a thing a couple of years ago that they uh, did a survey of all everyone who had uh, listed professional musician on their tax returns, and the average salary of those people was seventeen thousand dollars. Now, you know, <laughs> Bruce Springsteen did that too. He kind of skews it another direction, and everybody else. Mm -hmm. But all the people, you know, the ones that uh, at the one end, you know, make incredible amounts of money. But the other people, you know, it's just uh, it is what it is. They're doing it because they love to do it. They're not doing it because they're getting rich at it. So how 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 much time went by between Silk and this? A couple years. I quit Silk because I wanted to become James Taylor. I was uh, I was tired of playing rock and roll, and I wanted to do something. You know, the folky thing was happening, and I'd been a folky before I was a rocker and the whole thing, and that appealed to me. It appealed to me from a songwriting standpoint. So I kind of wanted to be James Taylor. So I quit the band and went in that direction. And uh, Bill Simzik, once again, he had left uh, ABC Records, and he had. A Another gentleman had started a, uh, one of the first independent labels called Tumbleweed Records out of Denver, Colorado. And he called me up, and I hadn't talked to him for years, so he said, are you still writing songs? I said, yeah. He goes, do you have any good ones? I said, well, yeah, I think they're good. And he said, do you want to make a record? He's like, well, yeah, who wouldn't? You know, <laughs> this is a real tough process here, you see what they, once again, it's who you know. He didn't hear the songs. They could have been horrible. You know, so half of them were. But at the same time, it was like you know, well, I got a record label. You know, it was like the Little Rascals. Let's put on a show. And so um, I went out to uh, Colorado and met with them and played them some songs. And they said, "Yeah, this is good." And they had there was actually five people on this label at the time. And the first guy they had signed was a Canadian guy by the name of Arthur Arthur Gee. And uh, that's my last name. So you really can't have five people on your <laughs> label and have two of them named Gee. It's just not that common a name to begin with, let alone to have, you know, 30% of your label named that. So they said, you have to change your name. I thought, whoa, I never thought about that, you know. And he said, well, you got to do it. And you got to do it, like, almost immediately here. And I said, what's immediately? They said, like, now. Because um, they had somebody coming from Billboard magazine to take pictures and of the, they used to do that all the time when you signed your contract they have pictures of you signing your contract mm -hmm. <coughs> so they, I said geez I well this is kind of a big decision I have you know I gotta put some thought into this and they said what's your middle name I said Stanley and they said Michael Stanley Michael Stanley and their exact words that won't offend anyone <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's planned enough to be fine. <laughs> so that's that's how I came up to be Michael Stanley. And to this day, if I get pulled over by the cops when I leave here, I cannot prove that I'm Michael Stanley. I can't do it. I have nothing that says that. But, you know, I mean, they, it doesn't work. So you went to Colorado and you make this record and you walk into the studio and the band is Barnstorm, Joe Walsh. No, 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 no. Uh, that band in the, on there, Joe was in the band. Right. Because he was working with Bill at the time. 
And uh, the rest of them were a bunch of guys, a bunch of hippies that Bill had met in Denver. And it was sort of the hippie capital of America after San Francisco at that point, in like 1970. And I couldn't even tell you the names of the guys in the band, unless I looked on the album. I still yeah, remember. I can't read. It's way too small. I do small. remember the gentleman's <laughs> name was Gaga. Oh. <laughs> not, not Pete Gaga, or just Gaga. And, <laughs> Um, so that's the kind of Oh, well, Vitaly is on it, though. He played flute on it. Right. But, yeah. And, they, uh, uh, and, so I, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just writing songs. I'd never been a band leader. I wasn't the leader of a band and these other bands I was in. I was just a guy in the band. And now all of a sudden I was supposed to be sort of, you know, leading this whole thing. And I had no idea how to do that. So Bill Simzik took over, because that's basically the role of a producer anyway, a good one. And uh, we made the album, and luckily, uh, the album did pretty well, actually, at the time. And uh, that was the album that Rose with Bitters was on, the original version. And to this day, I mean, I, I, I always say this too, it's, it sounds strange. I'm totally grateful for the reception that that song has had over the years, but I don't get it. I don't get it at all. I don't get why everybody likes that song. You don't even know what Rosewood Bitters are, right? I do. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> but it was, to me, it was, I did an okay song. It was all right. But that just goes to show you a lot of times, and this, this has been shown to be true the rest of my career, too. I'll go, I'll finish an album, I'll go, ah, this is the one they're going to like. This is the one. And nobody pays any attention to it whatsoever. And they, everybody gravitates, gravitates to some other tune that you thought, really? That's the one they like? Okay. But that's, you know, that's where we make them. We put them out there, and then you guys are the ones that decide which ones live and which ones die. You know? And some of these became pretty big live staples, moving right along, of course. Rosewood, you still play to this day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, was there anything on here that you thought you were saying, this is the one, this is the one? Um, well, Rock and Roll Man, a song called Rock and Roll Man, which we all, everybody that played on the record thought that was the one. And it wasn't the one. It wasn't even close to the one. No one's ever asked for it to be played or no, you know. We, we probably played it back in the early days, but it's just, you know, it was just one of those, one of those things. And at this time, are you touring with this record at no, all? No, I was working at a record store here in Cleveland. So I had a great, I had a great thing. I had like sort of a normal life. I was married. And, uh, I had a job, such as it was. And then on my vacations, I would go make an album. And then I would come back, and since I was working in a record store, then I would sell the album. <laughs> so not only would I make it, but you could come in and buy it from me if you wanted. <laughs> and the first album actually got you a second album. The second album. The second which album. Which is Friends and Legends, and, and, but now it's not Tumbleweed Record. No, it's, they, it's MCA. Tumbleweed, Tumbleweed Records folded. Uh, so unbelievably hard to believe for an independent label fold. Yeah. Uh, they sold the contract to MCA. So now we're, we've gone from the most, the smallest label you can get on to one, to one of the biggest ones. <coughs> and uh, when it came time to do the album, Bill said, you want me to put a band together for you? I said, yeah, please, put a band together. And it just, we got really lucky once again. And all these musicians had gravitated toward to Denver to live. So Joe Walsh had Barnstorm at the time, and they were off the road. And Stephen Stills had a band called Manassas. And they were off the road. So basically we got half of Joe's band and half of Steven's band. And they all came in here. Plus David Sanborn, who no one had ever heard of at the time, was a hippie living in upstate New York. And Dan uh, Fogelberg. Fogelberg, Richie Fure from Buffalo Springfield. <coughs> and uh, Jay Guy. Oh no, that was the first one. No, oh, no, that was, was this one. one. Yeah. Right, Jay Guy. So, but it was, the, it, it was the same sort of thing. It was like, I was just sort of I was just sort of along for the ride. I hadn't. I didn't go in going. We're going to make a record that sounds like this. And you're going to do that. And, and I would go into a room. The studio we cut that, that album in is probably no bigger than this room. And the way it works is, I would come and I would sit in the middle of the room with my acoustic guitar, and they would all sit around me in chairs like this, and they'd say, "Play the song." And you'd play the song, like for instance, "Let's get the show on the road." You'd play it like three times, and they'd all make some notes and ask maybe a question or two, and then we'd go. Everybody go back to their appointed places in the studio, and they'd say roll tape. And usually within three or four takes, that was it. It was over. Then you'd do the whole thing again. You move in the middle of the room, play them another song, 
we cut the we cut the whole album uh, tracks and about half the solo in four days, you know, which is you know how things used to be. And, and and let's get the show on the road. All of a sudden, becomes a big radio song in Cleveland and other places, St. Louis and yeah, and Denver. And at this point, I hooked up with this gentleman here, who had been one of the prominent DJs in town on MMS and, and uh, NCR. Yep, NCR. And I think he was just getting bored with the whole thing, and so I asked him to be my manager. You know, and. But neither one of us knew what we were doing, once again. And as, we, as, I, as I've gone on through the, through the years and talked to people and all sorts of nobody knew what they were doing. Everybody was making it up as they went along. The record companies were making it up because they didn't know what rock bands were all about. Radio, FM radio with John Gorman and those guys, John will be the first one to tell you, they didn't know what they were doing with MMS. They just started it and they made mistakes and they did things right and they got lucky. And, and it was the same with the bands. It's like, what do we do? Oh, I don't know. Let's do this. Okay. No, there was nobody to tell you no. So, but I was still working uh, in the record store, and so I remember. I remember very distinctly one night we were thinking, how can we? David and I were talking. How can we get the most exposure with the least amount of work? True American attitude. <laughs> and it was like television. Okay. Well, at this time, some rock shows had just started on television. There was uh, Midnight Special. And uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert, and so we, I just left it at that. And I still to this day don't know completely how, but in like a couple of weeks or something, David had gotten us a shot on Don Kirshner's rock concert, which is unbelievable. Even if anybody knew who we were, but they didn't know who we were or who I was. I think the whole deal was I think David lied to him and said like, well. We I'll get everybody who's on the record. I'll get everybody on the, on the record <laughs> to come. And luckily enough, we were able to get almost everybody. <coughs> but we were, and so here, I haven't played. A, I have not ever played a gig as Michael Stanley, and we're going to go do national television show live. You know, and we went out to L.A. and we went to one of the places called S.I.R. to rehearse. And I can remember everybody being there. All the, so here you have all these guys, you know, these all these big time musicians, and everybody's just sort of wandering around, looking at me. And Walsh came over to me and he said, "Michael, you got to take charge." <laughs> <laughs> and in the most honest moment of my entire life, I turned to him. I said, "Joe, I don't know how to take charge." And he goes. Okay, I'll take charge. <laughs> <laughs> and he took charge, and he got everybody together. Because he, I never rehearsed a band. I never taught songs to anybody. I never did any of that. And so I watched Joe do it. And he's a master at that kind of thing. And once again, it's just a learning process. But we did the show, and uh, it got a lot of great, great response. And and it was crazy. And then David, and I got back on a plane, flew back to Cleveland, and you know, I went back to sell the records at my. Uh, and my uh, job. And then you lost your job. And I did. Yeah, and I'm did, uh, sorry to this day about it. <laughs> I booked Michael in a competitor's record store. And um, that was I it. Liked, I didn't like that. <laughs> they, were, they were against that. So but I, it was yeah, so I had, I was, uh, so I was now jobless. Uh, my wife had just given birth to twins. On Elvis's birthday. Yes. Appropriately enough. And she had, she had obviously quit <clears> her job. So now we had uh, twins, uh, a new car, and no jobs between the two of us. And I was like, well, what do we do? What do I do? I knew what she was going to do. Well, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, I don't know how to do anything else. Well, my degrees in college were, were worth nothing as far as getting a job. And um, so I said, well, I'll start a band. You know? Why not? So once again, why not? Who knew? You know? So, da so, so David and I sat down and figured out how can we do this, you know? And he actually uh, he knew Jonah Coslin from high school when his name was Gary. And, uh, uh, sorry, Jonah. Um, and he was out in Denver, and he brought he came back, and we played a little bit, and it was like, yeah, that's cool. This guy's good. He writes some nice songs. He's a good singer and guitar player. The band uh, Glass Harp had broken up down in Youngstown, so we got Danny Pecchio, 
figuring, okay, he, he knows his way around. He's been in a studio before, and he knows he's been done gigs and stuff. And the three of us played as a trio, I don't know, about a year, year and a half, maybe. Because yeah. I didn't want to, I really was holding back on the, the drummer thing. Because I knew once I committed to a drummer, then I was committed. And also, if we committed to a drummer, we couldn't go to the gigs in David's car anymore. <laughs> you know, and everybody have a window. Yeah. It was important to have a we window. We had to have a truck, and then we had to have a roadie, and then we, you know, it was just like, it was, it was like, oh, this is going to get serious here, you know, and I don't, I don't know if I want to do this seriously, but that's the way, that's the way that went. But shows happen, you opened some shows for Walsh, you opened uh, for some the for the Eagles at that time, we for King Crimson, King Crimson uh, Loggins, yeah. and I think some of the Loggins and Messina dates were at that point. Yeah. And um, so you actually started to tour. Such as it were, yeah. We did, you know, we went up and we, we did some clubs in, Bo in Boston and we did some clubs in Chicago and we did, it wasn't a real, you know, real, whoops, my oh. career is falling down. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, it wasn't, a, it was, yeah, you were just, you were taking what you could get, you know. And um, I don't know, did you ever get those things from the Social Security Department where they send you the thing and, Shows you how much you made yeah. each year yeah. and what you're going to get when you retire. Well, <laughs> on mine, <laughs> in 1974, which is the first year of the band, it says I made nothing. <laughs> I made more as a sophomore in high school than I made as a married man with a band and two children. I made nothing, <laughs> zero. But <clears throat> we had to have made something, but there's yeah. there zero. <laughs> so we were, we were pretty much, uh, once we got Tommy Dovek, um, on drums, you know, that's when it all we all started to move in. Like, okay, this is serious. We got to get down and and do this. And what way. what was the feeling of like, let's get a drummer? Was it the other guys in the band tired of sitting on stools? Yeah, yeah they uh, they wanted to, they wanted to rock, and I was <coughs> just my hesitancy of committing to this fully. But you know, realizing that if we were going to do this, you know, even if we were going to keep an acoustic edge on the whole thing, we had to have a drummer. Um, and so we, got, we what you did in the old days when you won an, a drummer or a guitar player or whatever, you just started going to the clubs because the clubs were packed and the clubs were tons of bands and you and word you know words out there okay who's the who's the best guitar player who's the best drummer who's the best this and that and we knew Tommy Dovek was the best drummer I'd never seen him but you know I mean I heard his name and everybody else so we went to see Tommy he played in a band called Circus which at the time was probably the biggest local band. They're probably bigger than a lot of national bands, actually, as far as drawing people when they came here. So we went to the Agora to see him, and we walked in, and he walks out to go on stage, and his one wrist is in a cast, a full, full cast. And we're thinking, well, this is probably not really good for a drummer you know, to have a <laughs> cast on his wrist. And he still played just incredibly with a cast on his wrist. So we figured if he played that well, you know, broken. He's probably when he was, he's probably gonna be all right when he gets healed. So we immediately we had a little meeting. John and Danny and I was like, yeah, this is the guy. Let's ask him. So we ask him. He says no. You know, we keep coming back and asking him. He keeps saying no, because he is he was all he was very good friends with all the guys in his band. They were very tight. And and Tommy, God love him, he's one of my dearest friends in the world. He's not the most decisive person in the world, but. Once again, the running joke is, but it's true. To this day, he's never agreed to join the band. And, and we've been playing together 40 years. And one of these days, you know, I'm going to have to get a commitment from him. So you, uh, you form a band, and uh, all of a sudden, back with Bill Simzik again. And you go down to Miami at uh, Criteria Studios where the Allman Brothers and Eric Clapton and everybody who was anybody, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, they were making their records there. Um, did you take a different way to write songs now that you knew you had a band? Were you yeah. concentrated on writing songs, thinking Jonah could do this, Danny could do this? Well, it was also a thing about knowing jo Jonah was such a good songwriter. It was no knowing that I didn't have to write all the songs, and that you know. So it's in, and a normal album then was any you know, eight to ten songs, and uh, so I'm thinking, okay, I I only got to come up with four or five good ones. And right. Jonah comes up with three or four or five good ones, then we're okay. And Danny Danny wrote a little bit too, and maybe Danny would come up with something. 
so, um, and I was always a, I mean, I've taken a lot of heat from it o over the years, actually, from a lot of people, but because there was always, almost always through MSB, there was another singer besides myself. And I always liked bands like that. I mean, the Beatles were like that, you know, and, and so many, uh, a lot of the bands that I really, really liked, it was, wasn't always the same guy singing. And it was more, it was more fun for me. Now, it made it harder to, it made it harder to market us. It made it harder to have an identity if you had somebody that had two completely separate voices. But that wasn't really the point. I wasn't thinking like that. I probably should have, but I didn't. I was thinking, what, what do I like doing and what will be best for the band and what will keep the band happy? And uh, so that's the way it all started out. And, you know, Danny and I had probably logged the most studio time up to that point. Tommy had been in a little bit. Jonah had been in a little bit. Uh, but we went down there and it was, it was a great time. I mean, I think the, most of the songs, a lot of the songs we thought, well, we have to write these a little more, a little more rock and roll, a little more up because that will translate better to a live situation. But I, think the stronger, I think the strongest songs on that album are Jonah's songs. And how did you feel when you were done? Did you think, this is now, this is it? Well, I thought we were a band. <clears throat> I thought we were a band. I thought we made a good album. And I wasn't under the, you know, I wasn't under any delusions that it was, you know, Abbey Road or anything. Um, but it was, I thought it was a good first step for the band. And I thought it, it, it brought a lot, the band together a lot. And then we toured quite a bit on that, on that album. And that was another thing, you know, you get, you really find out, you really find out who you're, who you're working with when you're on the road in the studio because it's all very compressed. It's like, you know, if, if you go on vacation with someone, you know, you can't escape them pretty much, you're trapped. Uh, as opposed to, uh, um, I remember my, my wife before we, we got uh, married, um, she said, you know, well, we've really only spent like two or three days together the whole time, you know, here or there. We should really do something before we commit them. Should go, you know, we should go on vacation because we can't get away from <laughs> each other. We'll find out real quickly if we, you know, can stand each other. So uh, that's the same thing with a band. You know, you get in a tour bus with you know eight or ten guys, and you're gonna find out who's an idiot and who's who's not. Pretty <laughs> but this comes out on yet another label. This is now on uh, Epic. Yeah, we, we, I was another goal to be on every label we could possibly do. <laughs> <laughs> but why, I mean, why the change? Was, did MCA just say, you know, one, what, one was enough? I don't remember. Oh, okay. There's a lot of this I don't remember. I don't remember why, but all of a sudden we were on another label. And on Epic Records, which was part of the Columbia thing at the time. And uh, it was cool. I mean, it was, uh, like I said, well, once again, it, uh, I know you think everybody has a master plan, and maybe they do now, maybe they do, I doubt it, but um, we, we were just going along, doing it as it came, seeing what happened. But even oh, with this album, now you're going to St. Louis, Keel Auditorium, headlining a show over Ario Speedwagon and Foreigner, and you know, it's not Cleveland, it's not hometown, you know, someone else has really accepted Michael Stanley Band as their own. It, you know, it's a strange thing because it, you, you never, usually you're not liked by everybody across the country. You know, even, I don't care who you are. Everybody's got their pockets where they're bigger and this and that. It's like the, the running joke, but it was true, is if you're David and my age and, and you grew up in Cleveland, you thought the four biggest bands in the world were Bruce, MSB, Todd, and Roxy Music. <laughs> and I can remember when we started traveling around and I'd run into people and I'd start talking about Todd Rundgren and they'd be looking at me like, who are you talking about? Is he in your band? Rundgren, you know? yeah. Come on, come on. He's like, I don't know who you're talking about. Because that's your experience here, you know? Um, same with Roxy Music. You know, you probably couldn't find five cities in the world where they were a huge band. But if you grew up here, you thought, wow, yeah. Brian Ferry rules the earth, you know. So we had our pockets of strength, and we had places where we couldn't get arrested. And um, you try to figure out why in each of those. And, and most of the time, I couldn't come to a, an answer either way: why they didn't like us here or why they did like us here. You just took it where you could and tried to build on it. And you tried to the other ones. Uh, you know, it's like you know we you know you know how we were around here. Well, we we meant nothing in Columbus. You know, not very far away, or not nothing in Pittsburgh. 
you know, we did okay in Detroit. And, you know, they even named the theater after you in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh the Stanley yeah, Theater, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there are, quite, there are questions that you just don't ever get answers to. But once again, now you're touring with, with people like Mahogany Rush, Ted Nugent, uh, Cheap Trick, Rush. Uh, you know, you're getting out there and, you're, and the audiences are accepting you or they're not? Uh, most of the time, yeah. Because we, we were a decent live band at that time. We were getting better, but... And audience, I think audiences were more accepting back then. They, they liked four or five act shows. It was, they felt like they were getting more for their money. You know, now it seems like that that's, you know, wow, you're standing between me and who I came to see, you know, yeah. and uh, I always feel bad for opening acts. I don't care who they are or how good or bad they are. It just, it's a rough, it's a rough gig. But at the same time, other people, you know, we toured every foreigner tour there ever was. Because <laughs> they knew we, we fit their audience well, same type of um, thing. And they knew we could sell tickets. So they treated us well. You know, we didn't treat us just like, you know, the redheaded stepchild. And it was, a good, it was a good thing for both. And they also knew, it's also good to have an opening act that's pretty good. But it forces you as a headliner to be better. You don't want to walk out of there going, oh my God, the opening act just blew us off the stage, you know? I mean, I saw Elton John open for the Birds at Music Hall on his first tour. And I was one of the world's biggest Birds fan, but they were never a very good live band. And if, after Elton John played, if I was the Birds, I'd have got on the bus and left. It was like, why would you go out there? Because you're just going to look like idiots out there after that, you know? And strangely enough, for the first time in your career, you actually get a second record yeah, roll, with man. the same label, and that, of course, is the Ladies' Choice record. And um, Jonah gets the lead track. Yeah, Jonah, Jonah was a songwriting machine at the time. Yeah, he was, we were rooming together on the road, and he would write two or three songs a day. I mean, literally. And most of them were <coughs> good. Some of them were great. But, you know, I'd, I, was a little, I labored over it a little more. He just seemed to like, it came to him in a dream or something. And I came back to the room one day, and he was playing this thing. I said, what's that? And he played me the song, Lady's Choice. And I said, that's a great song. He said, I don't know. I don't know if that's very good. I said, I don't care if you think it's very good. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's a great song, and we're going to do it on the album. He goes, oh, I, I go, well, then, the hell with you. I'll sing it, you know. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it. So he said, okay, fine, you know. But that's the kind of, that, once again, it's just, you're just making it up as you go along. And are you more comfortable in the studio now? This is really like your fifth record overall, but yeah, your fourth the is you. Yeah, second record for the band, same producer, same studio. There's a, there was a certain amount of comfort there, and... And I think it's. I think there's better playing and, and singing on this album, and uh, and songwriting too. So I just I thought it was a step. Yeah. And at this so at this time between the touring, are you in a cycle now? It's like, okay, we'll go out for three months. We'll come home for a little bit. We'll write some songs. We'll go back out. I, well, you know, you you pretty well constant know, touring. Well, no, big a part of it at the time. It wasn't like oh, we're going to go out for three months. You went out when you could work. You went out when somebody would pay you to go out. And if that was a month, okay. If it was six months, okay. It was like you couldn't turn it down. <clears throat> Unless you had, the record company had said, you oh, know, well, we need a new album, so you got to go back in the studio. And at the same time, that, that presupposes that you actually had new material. So while you're out on the road, every, the, 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 one of the old truisms is you have your whole life to write your first album. You got six months to write your next one, you know, and that's what it is. It's all of a sudden. And back then, you got to remember, it was singles. It was all about singles. You got to have a single. If you didn't have a single, they they wouldn't release it, or they'd go, you know, write some more stuff. Um, they wanted FM tracks too. That was happening, but you had to have something for top forty radio, and it had to fit under a certain time frame, and it had to, you know, it had a lot of uh, qualifications that had to be met. So for this, um, so Ladies' Choice really doesn't do anything. Not too much. It just kind of was dormant, and and the label lost their you know lust for Michael Stanley Band, and they're talking about saying, uh, 
it's time for you to find a new label. <laughs> Which you were good at, I must say. Yeah. That's one thing we were strong at. Yeah. You hadn't been to Capitol, Eris, there were a few out there. Well, we went, David and I went up to New York to see one of the great gentlemen in the, in the music business who was the vice president at the time. And Steve of Pop the record Steve, table. Yeah, Steve Pop <laughs> and Steve was, he was great, just a great person, a great music guy, and an honest guy, which is very rare in the music business. And he said, um, and he wasn't a suit. He was a slob. He was a sweatpant. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, when you, so when you, if you hadn't known Steve, but we had known him before him, but if you hadn't known Steve and it took you to meet the vice president of, you know, Epic Records, you would have thought it was the janitor or somebody. I mean, really. He was like, when's the guy going to get here with the tie, you know? <laughs> but anyway, he was like, you know, he said, you know what? I figured it out. He said, you guys, you guys, they haven't captured you on record as good as you are live. I said, okay. Right, he had just come to Warren, I think, to see the band play down in Warren or somewhere and was blown away. And I said, I said so he said, so what do we do? And I said, well, why don't we do a live album? And this was at the time when Frampton Comes Alive had just come out and all of a sudden live albums were cool. They weren't before that. Live albums were something you did when you didn't have any songs new song <coughs> where the record company wanted to put something out because they had some tapes. Nobody cared about live albums. And what Frampton Comes Alive changed all that. It changed Peter's career, obviously. You know. Um, so we said to Steve Popovich, we said, you come in, we're doing a show in Youngstown. You check it out. If you don't like it, we'll part ways. If you like it and think it's worth it, let's do this live album. So he liked it. And so here we are going from almost getting kicked off the label to doing a double album, you know. And now obviously they're cheaper to make, so it's not a big financial investment for these guys. But the difference you know? is, on your live album, there's brand new songs. Yeah, well we'd had a, we had a whole new record written, and we were real, <coughs> real pumped on this record. And when the live album came out, I was like, how can we put a live album out when we've only had two albums out, you know? It's like... So with the whole thing, greatest like, hits. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll put the you know the ones that work best live. But we wanted to put four or five new things on here, which is what we did. And uh, so it's like you know Midwest Midnight and nothing's going to change my mind and and uh, things like that. So uh, we did the album four nights at the Agora, four nights five shows, one night I think the Agora held about a thousand people at best, and one night we put twenty eight hundred people in there. And but we still didn't hit percentage. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but, so then we took, the, we took the, the tapes from the four nights and, you know, picked out the best things from each of each song and that became the album. And I, this is another great story as far as the record companies go. Steve called me up and he said, you know, Michael, it's great. It sounds great. He goes, but there's not enough applause. And I said, Steve, I said, it's the Agora. Right. You, know, you know the Agora. Everybody knows the Agora. Everybody's played the Agora. They know it's not Madison Square Garden. You know, we can't have it sound like there's 20,000 people there. He goes, you know, he says, I know that, I know, but we've got to have more applause. He says, I'm sending you back the tapes. Take care of it. So he sent me back the master tapes. I put them on my dining room table for a month. And then I shipped them back to him. And I said, oh, it's all fixed. And he called me back the next day. He says, great, perfect, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing changed my mind comes off this record. <laughs> and it goes to number one in Parkersburg, West Virginia. Oh, I love Parkersburg. <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden there's like an excitement that now finally you're going up to Michigan and you're opening, I think, six nights with Bob Seeger and uh, on the one of these nights tour with the Eagles and uh, with a band this time instead of a trio and we yeah we'd also ordered we'd also added Bob Flander at that point on keyboards so we're now yeah why what what caused you to you know now there's no room in the car that's true <laughs> now we got to get a mobile home yep um, what, what brought on a keyboard player well Paul Harris who is a uh, was a great session man and had played in Manassas with Stephen Stills had played on the first two albums. So keyboards were all over the first two albums and, and I really always liked keyboards. So it was like, you know what, this is going to be an integral part of the 
thing, so we might as well try to find somebody. And Bob was playing in a band called Rain at the time. And uh, we found him and asked him to go, and he said yes. And, and went to, along with Tommy Dobek, he, the three of us have been playing together for 40 years, you know. And it really added a whole new dimension to Michael Stanley band. Yeah, it made us a better live band. Bob's a fantastic musician, he was a good singer. And then later on, uh, several albums, well, the next album, I think, actually, he and I started writing songs together, too. And that opened up a whole new avenue of, of things for me, because there, he was bringing in music to the, the thing that I would never come up with on my own. So it gave me uh, a lot more freedom as a songwriter. It's cool. But it also, live, now Jonah had somebody to play off of. Yeah. You know, he could, they could change solos, they could do this. Well, it was just, it was that time, you know, it was, it was, it was sort of that meandering FM radio time, too, where, you were long, really long songs were in vogue and, <coughs> and a lot of this, and, and it, it gave us more the freedom to do that. And um, just sonically it did. And Bob was a good looking guy, and his band had had a lot of girls follow that band, so we had more girls coming through. <laughs> that helped out. But Stage Pass didn't do the trick. It did in certain ways because you were really now all over the country. I mean, it really was a big, big, big step up from what it was, but it wasn't enough for Epic to say, let's go do another one. So it becomes uh, time for total, ch total changes. Right. Um, Jonah leaves the band. Joe left the band. He wanted to. He wanted to. Uh, he was very enamored by the, the whole punk thing that was just starting at that point, and none of the rest of us were. And he really wanted to do something like that, with that kind of energy and that kind of attitude. And he had written actually a concept album. Uh, and it was, uh, all was right, some, I uh, remember that. Some actually some really good songs in it, but and. Because it wasn't, it wasn't exactly like, you know, it wasn't that he was pushed in the background on MSB because he was in the front as much as I was. But he just had a different idea of what he wanted to do. And so it was like, okay, I mean, I understand that. You know, God love you, good luck. You know, we'll, we'll try to do what we've got to do and you do what you got to do. And then you got rid of your manager. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be a punk manager. <laughs> I don't know what that was all about. I think actually he wanted to make money. You know, get, uh, get something like that. And then you got rid of Bill Simzik, who's been like your security blanket well, we from the beginning. Bill. Bill got rid of us at the time. Bill had signed out with the Eagles. And Bill was more than willing to keep going with us. But the Eagles were an exclusive club. And they didn't want to share. They don't share well. So they didn't want to share with anybody. So they wanted Bill to be at their beck and call. And not to mention the fact that they spent a tremendous amount of time in the studio. And so it would, have been, it would have been almost impossible for us to work around that anyway. So for the first time, yeah, big changes were afoot. You know, we'd just gotten a new keyboard player. Now we've got to find a new guitar player and a producer and a label. Now, most people would quit at this point, you know. <laughs> But not me. <laughs> <laughs> Too stupid. Yeah. To play that I probably would have been a place to duck out right there. Not only that, you didn't even record in your own country. Yeah, we, we did. I remember we did a demo of three songs downtown. Yeah, at the old agency right. recording, and we sent it around. And uh, Clive Davis's Arista Records signed us, and they put us together with Bob Ezrin producer who had uh, worked, he worked with Alice Cooper and people like that and was going to do the wall coming up and things of that nature. And we were supposed to go up to Toronto to re or, uh, Montreal to record with him because uh, he liked the studio up there. That's the way things worked a lot too. Whoever had the most power got to pick where you went. So he had the most power in the relationship so he got to pick where you went. And literally about a week before we were supposed to go, we get a call and say, that's all, that's all done. It's not going to happen. So I, I still to this day, I don't have total you know, answer as to what happened. Obviously, he and Clive Davis got in some sort of conflict, and Clive said no. So within a week, we're on our way to uh, Wales, which we have to look up on the map to find out where it is. <laughs> 
two uh, record to be produced by a guy who we'd never heard of named uh, Robert John Lang, Mutt Lang. And uh, he was a great guy, great guy. And he was just starting to, his reign of terror, which was, uh, is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a nice song, though. Kind of like Catchy. it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we, we 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 went to England and uh, and met Mutt Lang. And on the weekend, he he nobody really knew him yet. He'd had a couple little minor hits in England with a band called City Boy. Um. And on the weekends, he would do us during the week, and then he would drive from Wales back into London. And on the weekends, we would work with this band called ACDC where they were doing uh, an album called Highway to Hell. And he would bring the tapes back, you know, and play, play them for us. You know. By the way, another band that opened for you. Four times. Yeah. In fact, their first American gig in New York City was opening for you and then was The Dictators. The Dictators. There's, now there's a show for you. Three dollars. I'll see three dollars. Wow. Yep. Downtown New York. Um, but Mutt was, uh, Mutt, at first we were kind of hesitant to working with them because we were all Simsic guys and that's the way we made records. And we would go, oh, you know, he's not doing it the same way. He's doing it differently. He's got different ideas. But after about three or four days, we realized he was making everything better. He was making us a better band. He was making the songs better by arrangement ideas and things like that. And he had a very unique way of recording. His concept was, you know, if something if you do it well once, it's going to be better if you do 12 of them. So, you know, if that was a really good guitar solo, do it 11 more times. If that's a good vocal, do it 10 more times. And this is the first time in the studio now with Gary Markaski. That's true. And has Gary been in a studio before? Not really. Not really. And to unleash Gary on the United Kingdom was <laughs> probably cool, but still. Uh, we, and we were, we were, we, we recorded out in Wales at a studio called Rockfield, where Dave Edmonds, that was his home studio and things. And it was a great place. It was built on the Rolls-Royce estate. And the Rolls-Royce house uh, has been empty for about 300 rooms. It's empty, but the stu they had a stable complex. And the studio was built at one part of the stable. And the other part of the stable is still a stable. And then another part of it, you live there, and there's apartments and stuff. So you got, you know, dirty musicians, dirty horses, and English food. And it's just <laughs> not good uh, Who smelled worse? Yeah, it was just a <laughs> So we went into, uh, um, then we mixed the album in, uh, in London, a place called Trident, and we were sharing the studio with uh, Genesis when they were working on the, uh, and then there were three albums. So I mean, the, the cool thing about being in the business is you just you know end up in neat places a lot of the times and with people that you know you're either a fan of or you get to be fans of and stuff and and you find out just like ev everybody else you know some of them are jerks and some of them are nice guys and you know it runs the gamut they're just people they just happen to be you know in the same business. Yeah, and you happen to be in the studio when the Bee Gees were doing um, you know the record that sent them back on the way, the uh, one with uh, Nights on Broadway. Yeah, the... Uh, Whatever that was called. Talk. Yeah. No, what was it called? Main Course. Main Course, Main right, course. right. Um, and they were really bad basketball players, too. Yeah, they had a good pot. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so was Clive happy with the record when it when it was yeah, done? Yeah, Clive was pretty happy, except for the he, he wanted one song to be a single, which was a ballad called "Why Should Love Be This Way," and he didn't like the piano on it, which was an electric piano. And he didn't like my vocal. I didn't think it was whatever. I don't know. What did he like about the song? He liked the song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he said, "I want you to do the piano over with a grand piano, and I want you to sing it over." And we was like, "Okay, but you know, Mutt Lang is now on to another project." So he says, well, you just bring the tapes to New York and I'll produce it, you know, meaning Clive. And so Bob Palander and I went up there to do that. And, 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 the, and at that time in the record business, Clive was pretty much equal to God. So you're like, you know, you're sitting there doing your thing and waiting for God to go yes or no, you know. 
And finally he got what he wanted and uh, we, we put that one out. But I think, actually I think the version that he didn't like is on, is on the CD too. We put the one that he didn't like on there, both of them. So you can make up your own mind. Oh, well that, that's good. And uh, you know, you move on and, and you're still playing a lot, right? I mean, playing all over foreigner tours playing all over like crazy and uh, you know, you, 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 you're still there and now it's time for yet another change and Dan Pecchio leaves the band. And uh, it's by Michael Gizmondi, who was a friend of Gary's from Youngstown. And Giz is just one of the nicest people in the entire world and one of the best musicians in the entire world. And musicologist. That's true. And um, it was a great addition to the band musically. I mean, it really put, uh, put another uh, step up in it. And that's no, that's no uh, slight on Danny's thing, but. Danny came from a trio background, and in a trio you have to play a certain way, you got to fill up a lot more space, and when you're a bigger band, you need people to lay out more and stuff, and, and pick their spots, and that's that's what we had become at that point. We and also added also ended Kevin Raleigh, Kevin Raleigh right. the second uh, keyboard player, and somebody that, to sing really, really high, girly type vocals. <laughs> And but why add a second keyboard player? What what was the because, thinking behind it? Well, Cabin Fever had, had been a, a much <clears throat> more keyboard-oriented album than anything else before. Bob had done a lot of overdubbing. And so to recreate these things live, we were going to need two keyboard players. And we had done a lot of vocal things where we were going to need another vocalist, too. So we hired Kevin. I didn't know Kevin beforehand. And uh, we hired him strictly as a sort of a utility guy. He was going to play keyboards, he was going to sing backgrounds, and that was going to be it. I didn't know he was a songwriter. I didn't know anything else about him. That just all kind of came as we went along. But once again, it was a place where, uh, I think the Cabin Fever album is the only album where I'm the only singer, the only lead singer. And, you know, I, so once it was obvious that Kevin was a really, really good singer, it was like, well, you know, we can utilize this more than we're utilizing this. You know, and it's going on the assumption too, that if you didn't like the way I sounded, maybe you would like the way he sounded. So whatever brought you to the album, that was the whole, that was the whole concept. We didn't care how you got there, just as long as you got there. You know. So we went out to L.A. to uh, uh, a place called Radio Recorders. And another producer. A new producer, Harry Maslin, who had just come off of producing uh, David Bowie's Young Americans. And he was kind of hot at the moment. So I, they put us together with him. He was, a nice, he, was a nice, he was a nice guy. So take a second now, producers, and when you look at the list of producers, you've worked with the best in the world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, how much do they actually bring to the record? How much do you let them bring to the record? Uh, where do you kind of draw the line that it's my name on it, it's not your name on it? Good question. It usually comes from their personality. <clears throat> and. Um, and their uh, portfolio of work. You know, the heavier they are, obviously, the more successful they are, the more power they have in their relationship. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you're gonna tell me what to do after I've done this, this, and this. Or other guys, you find, like, Harry was, a, Harry was a great guy, but Harry didn't have a big track record. I mean, he had one big album with David Bowie. So we could push Harry around. You know. But do you want to? I mean, are you no, looking no, you to the no, producer want for... To. I wanted to get anything I could get out <coughs> of Harry Maslin or anybody that would help us get to the next level. And every one of them brought something different. We learned something different from every one of the ones we worked with. Whether it was how to record this certain instrument or how to do this or a certain way of looking at arrangement. If, we, if you're smart, that's what you'll do. Right. You'll, you'll work with people that are better than you at certain things and, and learn what you can from that. But if we'd have wanted to push Harry around, we could have. He was that kind of personality. He was just, he was a really nice guy. He wasn't, a, you know, a head case. He wasn't, um, you know, taking a stance. And Clive Davis at Arista had picked out all the songs for the album. He had made us play everything that we had available, and then he picked out the songs he wanted on the record. So it wasn't necessarily the songs we wanted on the record, but it was what he wanted. Then when the record was done and we turned it into him, he said he didn't like any of the songs. 
which she was like, you know, oh, dude, you just pick these songs out, you know? <laughs> and he told us, he just told us straight up front, he said, I'm not going to do anything for the album. He said, I'm not even going to release it. And we said, well, you know, first of all, you chose these songs. You chose the producer. <clears throat> you did, it was all your choice. And now you'd say, you're not going to put the album out. I said, well, if you don't put the album out, we don't work. We can't work unless we have a new album out. And he said, well, okay, but I'm not going to do anything for it. And if a record company says they're not going to do anything for it, believe me, they're not going to do anything for it. And if they don't do anything for it, very few albums can make it on their own without you know, help from the record company. And he, was, and he didn't do anything about it, and there we were looking for a label again. He was true to his word. He was true to his word. <laughs> so are, are you writing any differently now because you've got two keyboards? You've got yeah. a vocalist that can do a little bit more than Danny could do. Uh, yeah, you, you, you're opening up a lot of, just about anything you wanted to do, possibility-wise. And are you in competition with anybody else, like with Bob or with Kevin for writing, or? Well, it was my decision. To, it was always my last choice. You know, I had the last say on what was going to happen. But I always let everybody, you know, I call it, it was a benevolent dictatorship. And you can't have a democracy in a band. It doesn't work. It just, it just doesn't work. Somebody has to be in charge. But I would give her, you know, when it came time to pick songs, we'd all vote on it. It's like, you know, hey, you pick, you know, you make your list of the ones you like the best, and, uh, this, and we'll compare them. And it, most of the time, most of them are, you know, everybody agrees on them. These are the best six songs, or maybe the last two if there's questions about it. So then you figure out, will one be more advantageous in keeping harmony in the band if we use this one, or are we heavy on ballads or light on ballads, or this sort of thing. So there's. You know, but the gist of the song, everybody knows what the best things are. But we, uh, when, once we got dropped by Arista, we really, that was a, there was a point there, it was like, you know, this is just getting nuts. And I think, you know, this is probably the end of the line. We, it was a good run, you know, we've had five or six albums or whatever and this and that. Longer than most bands go. And maybe it's time to, you know, grow up and get a real job and, you know, do that. So we decided that we would do one more album because we had a bunch of songs written that I thought were good. And we would do the album ourselves. We would pay for it ourselves. We would produce it ourselves without anybody's help. And then we would try and sell it to a label. And if nobody bought it, the label didn't buy it, we'd put it out ourselves, which nobody did back then. Um, and then we would break up. So we did what was left and became the Heartland album which I think is probably my favorite album, MSB album, overall. And we were, we were on our own. We were just, you know, we were in there like, okay, have you been paying attention the last five or six years? What'd you learn? And everybody, it was an amazing thing of everybody pulling together, uh, the band, everybody, there was no attitude, there were no egos, there were no, we knew we were all in it. And this was, uh, you know, this was the Batan death march and we were either gonna get through it or we weren't. And um, it was it was a great ex a great experience, but there are a couple things that re I remind, remember from that album, doing that album, was one Jimmy Fox from the James Gang, was now working at Falcon Productions. He thought he wanted to be a manager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so he had kind of like manager <laughs> training, and they put Jimmy sort of to oversee us, so that, thinking that we were just going to go into the studio and like drink beer all day or something, you know, and <laughs> wait to the, at a hundred dollars an hour. <coughs> and Jimmy was sitting, uh, and Jimmy's one of the nicest guys in the entire world. He was sitting next to me one day in the studio and goes, this song needs something else. And I said, yeah, it needs a saxophone. He goes, well, you know anybody around here? I said, no, I don't know anybody around here. He goes, well, if you could have any sax player in the world, who would you get? He says, well, what about David, David Sanborn? You've worked with David Sanborn. I said, no, this is not a song for David. This is not his type of thing. I said, I need somebody like Junior Walker or Clarence Clemens. I need that kind of in-your-face rock and roll sax player. Jimmy just shakes his head. And he goes away. Like three days later, he comes back and he goes, Clarence is going to be here on Tuesday. <laughs> I said, Clarence who? <laughs> Clarence Clemens. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you said you wanted either Junior Walker or Clarence Clemens. He said, well, Junior Walker can't do it, but Clarence Clemens can do it. He'll be here on Tuesday. And I said, well, how did you do that? And he goes, well, I called him up. 
<laughs> and I said, you just can't call up Clarence Clemens. He goes, sure you can. I go, and he says, what's the worst he can say? No. He says, you know, that's the worst thing he can say is no. Well, it turns out that Clarence, they were on a break, you know, tour-wise. Hard to believe those guys were on a break, but they were. And Clarence at the time was romantically involved with some young Cleveland lady. And so he was all happy to come back into Cleveland. <laughs> and he even said, you know, you don't even have to pay me. Just fly me in. <laughs> Put me up in a hotel for a few days. <clears throat> I'm good. And so I was like, wow, this is so cool. So the day before he's supposed to come, and we knew we wanted him to play on Lover, and we knew we wanted him to play on He Can't Love You, and we had a couple other ones we thought. But then we all, we, the, the truth came down, and we realized the moment of truth, like, well, what if he sucks, you know? Because a, a lot of people, you know, they, they do suck in the studio. It's really a pulling teeth. And you go, who's going to tell him if he's bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's Clarence Clemens, and he's 6'8", you know what I mean? <laughs> And they're all, they're all of a sudden the band's looking at me, well, you know, you're the leader. <laughs> I think you're going to have to tell him if he, if he sucks. And luckily he didn't. And uh, he, he, was, he was a great, great guy and a great person to work with in the studio. I ended up working with him a few more times on a couple of Brown's projects we had. And uh, that. And the other thing I remember about that album is that we were down to the, we needed one more song. And I was leaning toward this rock song that we had. And Tommy Dobek came up and he said, he said, what about that ballad that we rehearsed? And I said, uh, what are you, which one are you talking about? He said, I don't remember the name. Tom doesn't remember the name of the song. So he hummed something and I said, oh, I said, that's called Lover. And he said, I think we should do that one. And I said, I, I, just, I didn't get the feeling that everybody was very into that song. You know, I mean, the band didn't seem to be too into that song. He goes, no, I think we should do it. And so, that it almost didn't make it on the album. That's the way that those things work, you know. And, and then you guys screwed up royally we because you were gonna, you know, the whole plan was do it and be done, and you end up with a top forty hit. And with two top forty hits, yeah. An album that stays on the charts a year and a half, and nonstop touring. And I mean, so for the first time <coughs> in our career, and actually there was like three or four record companies trying to buy the album. So from going from nobody wanting us to all of a sudden, here's four labels and bidding on it. And I think uh, part of the success, although I think it was really strong song-wise, album and playing-wise, part of the success of that is that we, the time, once again, timing. It was released right when MTV started. We were with a company, EMI, who were committed to this new form of, you know, promotion. And so we right away went and did a video. Nobody knew what they were, once again, nobody knew what they were <laughs> doing. The guys that were making them didn't know what they were doing. We didn't know what they were doing. I defy you to tell me what the story in that video is. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there is no story, even though they tried to tell you it was. Some of it's in my driveway. That's true. No, that's, that's not that one. Oh, that's, wasn't that? No, that's my town. Oh, that's my town. You're right, sorry. Actually, but it was his driveway first. The, so when the video got, got done, literally, uh, MTV had like 30 videos. That's all they had. You know, because people were all of a sudden were running around, oh, we got to get a video, we got to get a video. Well, we were one of the 30 videos. So it got played like a million times. You know, the He Can't Love You video. And, you know, it was a big reason why the, the song was a hit. And now you're doing Merv Griffin, you're doing American Bandstand. We don't know. I mean, that's, that's cool stuff. It was. It was like, well, this is the way it's supposed to be, you know? And, and then, but then again, once again, and we're out there touring constantly. The band was playing really well. But then all of a sudden, it's like, the record company's calling for another record. And it's like, oh, man. You know, we got to start writing some songs. And, you know, you can write songs on the road, obviously, and you have to, but it's, it's not as easy as doing it at home. And, but that's what had to happen. It was like we had to uh, get together and, you know, a whole new bunch of songs. And we knew we were going to have to follow something up that a lot of people had heard, so there was more pressure on it from that standpoint. So you guys go in and you do the, uh, the North Coast record, and you had a formula. It was like, don't have a label, don't have a producer, don't have anybody telling you what to do, and, and you just do what you want, but you go back to uh, old habits and bring in another 
producer, but one who had worked with Led Zeppelin and a guy named Jimi Hendrix and Beatles. Beatles, I remember those guys. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. we went in this time. We with Eddie Kramer. Track. We went in this time with a little attitude. Like, you know, it was you can see that in the picture, oh, actually. Yeah. It's our Rick Springfield period. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea that, okay, you know, we, we proved we can produce, record, write a successful album. And we want your help, meaning Eddie Kramer's, whatever he would bring to it. But at the same time, you know, we're the, we're the boss. And uh, it worked. It, it was, Eddie was fun, fun to work with. He's a great guy. He had great stories. I think that album um, probably sounds the most like we did live. I mean, I think it's the best representation of what we sound like live. And I thought there was, uh, it wasn't as many good songs as on Heartland, but I think there's a lot of good songs on it. This seemed to me at the time that it was like Heartland Part Two. Well, I mean, besides having a song called Heartland on it, it was, um, it really seemed like those two albums, it could have been a double album. Yeah, probably a bunch of those songs, if I actually looked at them and thought about it, probably some of those were leftovers from the other album that we just, you know, we had, we had a lot of material for the Heartland album that didn't get on there. I mean, there's still some, there's still some things that Clarence played on that no one has ever heard. And no one will, because I can't find them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to dick about it. I just can't find them. <clears throat> but I know there's two cuts. I know there's two so two other songs of Kevin's that, that Clarence played on. And I I have no idea where they are. And are you feeling pretty good about things right now? Yeah, it was good. It was like, well, this is the way. This is the way it's supposed to. This is the way it's supposed to be. You know, I mean, we weren't. You know, it wasn't like you know we hadn't turned into U2 or anything, but we were we were successful, and we were doing it right, and we were getting better as a band, we were getting better as producers, we were getting better as songwriters, and that's, you know, that's all we had control over. And you're actually really making a living for a few years now. Yeah, 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 you everybody's, know? you know, people are starting to like, you know, actually buy a house instead of rent, you know, or uh, maybe get a new car instead of, you know, the one that the floorboard gone. Right, and yeah. Like <laughs> and for the first time since Epic now, you're actually going to be doing a third record for EMI. And, uh, but once again, another, another producer comes in. Yeah, well, but it, this is the second in a row that's produced by the band and a producer. Well, a lot of that too had to do with, even if we <coughs> wanted, if we wanted to keep the one from before, it came down to scheduling. Okay. Is he available? Is he booked? They don't just sit around waiting for us to call. You know, they've got other things that they're doing. And and so this time we worked with a guy that we had known. He w used to be an engineer at VG Studio in Florida, uh, a guy named Don Gaiman, one of the world's nicest people. And um, he, was, he was great to work with. And he was just coming, it hadn't been released yet, but he had just uh, done the Jack and Diane album for it, Mellencamp, and that was gonna change his life dramatically, both of them. <coughs> was he working more as an engineer, or do you think, it, for you guys yeah, at this yeah, point? Yeah, or? I mean, he gave, we wanted him more as an engineer, because that's what he had come right, from. Right, right. He had a lot of good, he had a lot of good production ideas, but at the same time, you know, we were, we were producing it. Right. And, and the songwriting, once again, you know, Kevin's writing, you're writing, Bob Bob's writing. writing. Um, is it harder to find the songs now because you're working so much? You know, where are you finding the time to, you know, physically do the writing on this? I don't know, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, you, you sit in hotel rooms and do it. You know, you sit in the, on the bus and try to do it. You, uh, you do it wherever you can. I mean, as a songwriter, anytime somebody asks me, you know, for songwriting tips, I said, there are, there's no rules. You get them wherever you can. You get them and whatever it takes to get them. You know, sometimes they come really quick, sometimes they come in a dream. Sometimes, I worked on a song for seven years before I recorded it, you know, because I didn't get it the way I wanted it. Um, they're like, uh, you know, they're like kids. You know, they're all different. And then you, you know, you put them out in the world and see how they do. Well, kids do better, <laughs> most, songs, most, <laughs> most songs get hit by a truck. I mean, <laughs> But I, I remember in the early days you used to say, you know, it's your best time to write was during the Johnny Carson show. I always wrote with the television on. Yeah. I, I tell that to other writers and they're like, oh my goodness, how could you do that? I didn't necessarily have the sound up, so I would have it very low. Or The best thing would be like a game, you know, a, a basketball game or a baseball game or something. I was never big at sitting in an empty room 
you know, with a guitar doing it or something. And because you never know, you look up at the screen and all of a sudden there's some visual up there that just sets you in one direction or another. Or, you know, people will say, songwriters almost always carry around little notebooks or, the, you know, now we all have little digital recorder things, but you might say something here today just in, you know, in passing. And, and if you, you might have noticed when my eyes will glaze over because I've already gone, I'm already processing that going, ooh, that's a good song title. I can't forget that, you know. I know she's still talking, but I, if I can't listen to her now, <laughs> I'll forget that. And I can't, I can't tell you how many times that happens. And I'll write, and I'll write them down. And sometimes I won't come back to them for three or four years. I just keep going through the book, and I'll see this title, and I'll, and I'll go, yeah, that was a cool title. And then it's up to me to figure out well, what's it all about, what's the story behind this title. I mean, that's one way of going in songwriting. You know, the other way is starting out with something that you have particularly in mind. I want to write a song about this. You know, that's the other way. But a lot of times, it's, that's the fun of it. They're just they're puzzles. So, writing songs is a puzzle. Making records is a puzzle. It's just moving pieces around going, that doesn't fit, this fits. Oop, there's the picture. And the great thing is, I, I finally realized, you know, I used, to, I used to take it as a real compliment when people would ask me, like, to explain a song to them. And I realized nine times out of ten after I did, they were bummed out. <laughs> because it wasn't, what, it wasn't what they thought. And, you know, and, <coughs> and, I, and so I'd say, well, what did you think it was about? And they would tell me. and. Surprisingly, a lot of the time, their I, their thing was better than mine. <laughs> and I, but when, but I didn't see that until they explained it back to me. I was like, okay, I see where you got that, and that's actually really better than what I intended. <laughs> you know, so, that's so you got so you know whatever the song means to you, as long as it means something to you, as long as it hits you one way, that's, then we're successful as songwriters. I mean, it's that's all you're trying to do is spark a, an emotion in somebody that, you know, I, I want it to mean something to you that other people's songs meant to me, the way I feel about it. I have songs that I go back to, and or they represent a certain time or a certain, you know, if I'm feeling one way or the other, I go back to that song, you know, if I want to cry on my beer, or if I want to be happy, or I want to do whatever. And I think that, that's the cool thing about it, you know, and so if it does hit something in you, whatever it is, then as a songwriter then I've been successful and that's good I just heard this story the other day the song Everybody Loves a Clown Gary Lewis and the Playboys you know I thought this is a song he wrote about you know some girl thinking oh he's so funny blah 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 it was a song he wrote for his dad for f he was one to write him a song for Father's Day <laughs> And he started writing this song, and when you think about it, you know, his dad, the ultimate clown. True. And then he said, uh, well, the song was so good they recorded it, so he bought him a car instead. <laughs> so, so now, unprecedented in your career. We're going to be here like eight days. Yeah, we are. A, a fourth album with the same label. Yeah. And, and now you have a song on it called My Town, and, um, and now you're really... Really smoking. Well, we started we started writing and recording that album, and My Town wasn't written yet. And uh, the, the label came back to us, and they said, "We want, uh, in their in their words, we want an anthem. You know, we want something that's you know, anthemic, something that's just you know, that type of thing." And so after we tried to figure out what an anthem might be, you know. Uh, the basic question came: Well, what's the what's what's the most common thing to everybody? You know, throwing the whole you know love concept out of the thing. It can't be a love song. It's like, what's the most common thing to everybody? And it's like where they live. You know, that's you know that's the that's the bottom line. Everything starts from that. So I mean, and people said over the well, you know, you wrote this song about Cleveland. I said, well, yeah, I wrote about Cleveland. It doesn't say Cleveland in it anywhere. It doesn't say anything about Cleveland. It doesn't refer to anything in Cleveland. I mean, I know what it refers to. <coughs> the only, you know, the only, the thing I would say that it overtly refers to in Cleveland is, you know, when I say East Side, West Side, because we think of ourselves here as East Siders or West Siders, but so do eight billion other towns 
or their north side, north side, south side, or whatever. But there's no, you know. Weren't there like 50 versions of that there song? Were 200 that you did? versions. 200 of that versions? Song. They got it. They're, actually, it start, they started, somebody came up with this. There was a, back in like 56, there was a guy named Tommy Randazzo, I believe his name was. He might have even been from Cleveland. Teddy Randazzo. Teddy. Yeah, Teddy. He did a song called High School USA. And in, if you heard it here in Cleveland, it was a song was going by. Every, every like you know other second somebody was screaming out like Benedictine, <laughs> shake your head, you know, Fairview, <laughs> you know, the, and but they Rocky did it, River. They did it in every city. <laughs> yeah. So somebody remembered this, and so they said, "My town." So they said, "We're going to do a version for every city." I said, "Well, that's going to take a long time." <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, Bob Philander and I went up to New York, and for a whole afternoon we stood in this in a studio with our headphones on and going, you know, Des Moines, you know, Chicago, <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> and so these, they would come out in the, in, in the city and these people would think, wow, what nice guys these guys are. <laughs> I wrote a song about Rochester. What? <laughs> but it worked. It did. It I worked. mean, the song it starts worked. going up the chart and all of a sudden, <laughs> You and the record company have a little uh, tete-a-tete. Yeah, you, well you got, this is where, you know, you, you, you go your whole time trying to get to a position where you have a little power, where you have a little bargaining power. Nobody was trying to, like, you know, hold anybody up for millions of dollars here. The point was our contract was up in, like, six months. And the record had just come out. The album had just come out. My town was like in the 30s already on the charts. The album was was doing really well. And so the record company realized, I'm like, oh, we might, you know, this album goes crazy. We're going to lose these guys. We could lose them. So they, they called up and they asked, they wanted me to sign a six-month extension. And so for the first time in my life, I figured we were in a position of power. You know, and it was like, okay, we've had successful albums for you. We have it single which is going crazy we have an album which is going crazy we're touring i'm not going to sign this six months extension if you want us sign us for another three years you know figuring full well that they're going to do it well they didn't you know they called my bluff and um that day they pulled all their support of the record the album everything and uh, that was the end of that. Yeah, we, we never knew, we'll know how that album actually would have done. But that led basically to cut the next nine albums short here. Yes. Yeah. That, <laughs> that led to the end of the band. We tr we tried there were only two more. There were only two more we MSB tried, records. Yeah, we tried to, <laughs> we tried to uh, keep it together as long as we could. But. Um, and there's one, some people have a misconception of what the whole thing was about. A lot of people think we broke up because like, we didn't like each other or there was all this, this and that. And that wasn't the case, in the least. You know, we have our quarrels and things, sure. It's like I'm being married to six guys, you know. Think about that later, just being married to six guys. <laughs> um, for 13, 14 years, I, I paid 13 people every week. That's how many people were on the band and the crew. Everybody got paid 52 weeks a year for 13 years. It wasn't going to happen anymore. The, we were without without a major label. We couldn't work as much. Without working as much, we did have, the income wasn't in there. It was a thing of I can't financially keep this together. And so my concept was: if I can't financially keep it together, I don't want to. I don't want this to go sliding down this way so we end up playing the Holiday Inn at Northfield you know I wanted to go out as high as we could so that's basically what we did we said okay this is it um, we're going to do a couple shows farewell shows and that will be the end of it um, and so we, we booked a couple shows at the front row and they kept selling out in like a minute and a half and we kept adding more and more and I, I think it ended up being 14 at the end 
which was almost like having a regular gig, you know. You got up in the front row and <laughs> did a show, went to bed, went up in the front row. <clears throat> but I think, and the thing, one of the things I'm most proud of is I think anybody that saw the band in that last stand of shows saw the band as good as they ever were. It would have been really easy for the other guys or anybody to just go through the motions, like this is over, the hell with it, you know, taking the money and run, you know. But everybody, you know, everybody put their big boy pants on and uh, I think, you know, if you saw those shows, you saw the band that, as good as they ever were. How hard was it to do the first one of those shows? I don't think the first one was hard. The last one was hard. I know, the last one was hard. The, uh, I don't remember much about the first one. I don't remember much about, you know. Remember, you got 14 shows we were going around the circle. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How long did it take to like walk straight after <laughs> 14 very nights very on that stage? <laughs> the, the, I said the thing is, I like to sing to somebody in the audience. I like to pick out somebody to sing to them. And at the front row, you know, so, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> say I take her out right here. And I'm singing to Terry, right? And I close my eyes for a minute while I think, and then when I open my eyes, there's a, like a biker singing. <laughs> <laughs> it ruins the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the MSB part of your life is, is about to end. You've got the record at Blossom, which I think is like 34 years ago this week or this month or something. I don't know, really? Yeah, I just read that somewhere. I, I just don't know. I, 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 so I have this mental block for this. I have no idea. I can't ever remember what year that was. I think it was 82, but I'm not sure. Uh, and 83. 83? Oh, so it's like... There you go, see? Yeah. Hey. Wow. I don't know. That's a but, you know, I mean, I certainly remember the whole experience, but in terms of putting it in a time frame, that's a whole other... No, 82. 82 it was. Yeah, 82. Oh, I'm going to have some mud wrestling here, I think. No, it's not August 82. Go a little bit. <laughs> well, and then, you know, at the Coliseum down there, you, you know, you drew, you sold that place out with... Uh, we did it the right way, Dave. We set the attendance record in buildings that were soon to be torn down. <laughs> <laughs> Blossom's no one, still no, there. No one, will break, still no one will break the Coliseum record. No one will break the front row record. No the Agora record. The Agora record. <laughs> right. yeah. No one will break the Coliseum record. And no one will break the Blossom record because they lowered the attendance thing. There. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. They could do more nights. Nice. But they, they, they couldn't do as many tickets as they So, we're gold. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, those are things to really be proud of. And be proud of the musicians that you've brought yourself, well, you know, were, to they, play no, with. None of us ever thought anything like that was going to happen. You know, you, you didn't go, I'm going to get in a band and break an attendance record. Right. Right. <laughs> Blossom, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> to the top. The Blossom was, <laughs> yeah. When they build it. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, no, those were just... So a lot of a lot of things we set out to do we didn't do, you know, we weren't as successful as we would have liked, you know, totally. We certainly lasted far longer than I thought we would. You know, we didn't set out to set attendance records or things like that. They just that was a wonderful byproduct. And you guys set the records. We just showed up and played. It wasn't us, you know. We were there every night. You know, whether. But the cool thing about this band in one way is that, and it made it hard for anybody to get really fall into their rock star trip. Because, trust me, like after like four sold out nights at Blossom, probably the next show we had, we played in a club somewhere for a hundred people. You know, at some place that didn't give a shit who we were or anything. So it's a pretty humbling business. Oh yeah, when, uh, but if you're, if you're basing your whole reason to, for being on, on that huge crowd, then yeah, right. you get suicidal. But we've, got, we've done that our whole career. We had places where we were big, places where we were unknown, places in the middle, so we, we would just go through the whole gamut of them as we crossed the country, you know? And I can't tell you, I can't tell you why we were, you know, we did better in, you know, Texas than we did in, you know, Michigan, yeah, but we did. Why did we do better in Northern California than in Southern California? Why did we do better in New England than we did in, you know, the South? When you look back at, at all of those shows you've played, are there two or three that really stand out? 
I mean, I know, I think, you know each town looks the same to me, the movies well, and the factories. Well, they have, they have. <laughs> I think I, the one that stand out to me the most was the first time uh, we headlined the Coliseum. And my job as, as the leader and the guy in the middle and everything else is when we would hit the stage, I was always, you know, I would always turn, I would have to make sure everybody was ready. Are you ready? You're everything, everything, you're all, your stuff working? You okay? You all right? You okay? Yeah, everybody's cool? Because sometimes you go out there and all of a sudden, you know, you, you your guitar and there's no sound. And you go, I don't know, you know. So I would always be that. And as soon as I got through the, the lineup and everybody's okay, then I could count off the first song. And I think that kept me from, kept me from butterflies too a lot. It was just, I have to do this, I have to do this. And I can remember Gary, I turned to, you know, we d I did that, and I turned to uh, count the song, and Gary Markaski grabbed me and he goes, dude, he says, wait a minute, just turn around, dig this. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, this is very cool. <laughs> you know, and everybody was standing up and with the lighters and the whole thing. And it was very cool, but it was, when I was saying that, I was like, oh, this is pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just count this off and do this, you know, but it's, it's, not, so, it's not so much the, the, you know, I couldn't tell you what songs we played on a certain night, and I couldn't tell you this or that. It's more the, you know, the experience, you know, the Blossom experience, I think, was the, the highlight of the thing. That was just a great place to play, and I think people really like going to shows there, you know. Um, for a band, Blossom was much better than the Coliseum. The Coliseum is not very musical. You can't hear anything you're doing on stage. You know, it's you're really you're really fighting the whole night just to, you know, make sure we, everybody ends together and so you can't really as a musician, you can't enjoy it as much. Blossom is mu was built for music, so it's much more it's much friendlier that way, and we can enjoy it. Uh, you know, so that things like that come into play. And it, and it wasn't the size of the crowd necessarily, you know, all those were, sometimes you, you had to step back and, and go like, this is, this is nuts. <laughs> you know, you'd look out some at Blossom and <coughs> as far as you could see on the sides, I mean, what, what, were, those people, what were those people looking at? You know, <laughs> they, what did they actually, their mind, what would they see? I don't know. <laughs> you know, you're thinking, well, this is crazy, you know. The other, in case you don't know, too, I, mean, I know the Blossom experience is one thing, but then the show's over and you, you spend all that, you know, you spend your two hours getting out of the parking lot, you know, you know. Well, I don't know if you know this, but in Blossom's ultimate wisdom, there is only one way into Blossom and one way out. You take it, so do we. We had to wait till you were all gone. <laughs> so, we could, so we would be there like three hours after a show. Not because we wanted to be. We had to wait because we would just be sitting in the, in the traffic jam with everybody else, you know. Well, I think, um, you know, we still have we still have this stack. And then I did these. <laughs> and then he did these, which is um, from the Ghost Poets. And, and then you, you know, reverted. I just realized you actually, like, autographed one of yeah, these for me. That was nice of you. Um, <laughs> anybody have an Who's eBay account? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we should probably do, Cindy, if you're good with this, is that, you know, another time we sit down and, and talk about the rest of your life so far um, because you've also been involved with a lot of charity projects that have helped a, a lot of people out that I think uh, you know needed to be noted uh, the sports teams in Cleveland have you know accepted you as one of their own either through your music or through video or, or just association with and um, you know, I think that that's, that's another thing we need to talk to at some point, but we also told the people that came that if they had a, a question or two that they wanted to ask, that we would give them that opportunity. So why don't, uh, we well, we have a microphone right over here, so if anybody does have a question you can. and uh, can, can move their way over to the microphone, oh, okay, we can, uh, we can do that. Oh, not him. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, what did you do uh, at the time of those decisions, which uh, at the end of the band, which you were riding pretty high, did you do anything different, did you make any different decisions in retrospect, you thought about it? 
Yeah, in retrospect, I'd have taken the six month thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know. As far as the band was concerned, I would uh, continue. I would have loved to see the band continue. I think we were heading towards a thing where um, I think Kevin probably would have left pretty soon because he was getting into that thing like the Jonah had it before. You know, he was a he was a major talent in his own right, and he wanted to call all the shots and something. And I totally understand that. Um, and if that had happened, uh, you know, then we'd have just rolled on like we always did when something happened. Um, yeah, I, if I had to do it over again and know what I do now, yeah, I'd take the six-month extension. Who knows what would have happened then? Um, but once again, it comes down to the, you know, uh, every, everything for everything for a reason. And uh, I don't know whether uh, I would have gotten these all the stuff that I've done on these solo albums over the last 15 years out if I was uh, still in that situation. Probably not. I don't know. I don't know how much longer we could have stayed on the road as consistently as we did without falling by the wayside. It's not an easy life, you know. It took, you know, takes your health. You know, it's really not good for relationships, you know, or your kids or anything else. I mean, you, you know, you're being kind of selfish about the whole thing when you do that. And I was, I was lucky enough to have. You know, a wife who was very supportive of that at the time. But I know my kids, you know, they were not, you know, they were not real pleased about being Michael Stanley's kids. You know, that was kind of, I think that was more of a burden. Anyone else? Michael, you were, uh, you uh, were the bass player in a group, sort of like the pre-rock and roll. Was it Silk or? I was a bass player in Silk. In Silk, okay. And then that, and before that was a group originally called the Tree Stumps. The Tree Stumps. I was a bass player, yeah. Um, I'd never been a bass player until they asked me to be the bass player in a band. And it was like, well, once again, it's like one of those. <laughs> they go, we fired our bass player. You want to join the band? Well, yeah, but I don't play bass. Well, can you learn? <coughs> can you learn like by Tuesday? Okay. You know. McCartney had never played bass either. <laughs> what was that? Was that your star, your intro into performing? Well, I'd been in a band in high school, but at, at the same time, you know, none of us, that was just fun. It was cool. We did it. It was like, you know, when no, no one certainly thought that, you know, we were going to do this for a living. None of the guys I know. I don't even know if guys like Eric and those guys thought, okay, this is going to be something we're going to do forever. We were doing it at the time. How was the tree stump reunion? The tree stump reunion was pretty trippy. I'll tell yeah. You. <laughs> it was. It was way fun. It was. What, what, like, what material did you do? What you played did, back then? Yeah, everybody pretty much played stuff that they, would play, they played back in, in, you know, 64, 65, 63. <laughs> it was crazy. It was, you know, and, and, and most of the guys were still real good. I mean, I, when they did the first set, which was with most of the original members, I mean, I just, it was a time travel. You know, they were yeah. doing stuff off, you know, it was all first albums, first Beatle album, you know, first so-and-so album, first this album. I mean, they were the, they were the band that I, I want, all I wanted to do was be in a band that was as good as those guys. Was it the Tree Stumps that opened for Credence? No, it was Silk. Silk. Yeah. Was that the first big band you had ever opened for at that point? No, we'd opened for uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears when they were on their huge you know, back spinning wheel time. Right. We opened for Sly for about seven dates. We opened really? Did he show up for all of them? Not all of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. And, and one of them, he came. To, he did show up and said, uh, Larry Graham came up to me, the bass player, because I don't wait here for me. I wasn't the leader of the band. He's, I thought I was the bass Tallest player. Tallest or something, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Sly wants to ask you something. What he was, well, Sly wants to go on first tonight. And I said, I said well, who the hell is going to stick around after Sly plays? You know, it's like, you know, uh, you know, so, you know, Sly plays. So he opened for you? He opened for us, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell your John Fogarty story? No, I don't want to. Okay, you were, okay we won't talk about that. Uh, Anyhow, thank you so much. Um, you've had a, an amazingly successful career. You brought Cleveland to so many outsiders and um, thanks for staying here.
Thank you. Thank you for your help in it all and everybody's. And uh, um, congratulations to Joe on the exhibit. It's really fast. Fantastic. I have to tell you, Joe, I hate Rush. <laughs> but I love, oh, wait, I'm looking over there. <laughs> well, this is, I'm really? on camera no. here. <laughs> Joe, I, I hate this band. I know they're your favorite. I, I cannot stand his voice. I think they're great players. But these pictures are just fucking amazing. I mean, I would put this up in my house if everybody I knew didn't know what I think about these. Sorry, things. Dave. I'm leaning toward the Taylor Swift one. Right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do like that. And by the way, Bill Simzik's favorite band. He loves these guys. He does. I'll yeah. give you a rush print if you let me give you three CDs to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> I can be bought, you know? <laughs> thanks. Thank you. And if you guys, if, uh, Cindy and everybody, if, if you, 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 you folks, thanks for coming out, first of all. And if you want to continue on this second half of this thing sometime, I'll be glad to. It's very interesting. Yeah. We got, uh, just over halfway through. Unbelievable. How I spent my summer vacation. Great. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, very much. Thanks, Whoops.